While seeing how last year everyone seemed to enjoy seeing me get tortured with the Disney sequels, this year I'm gonna do something kinda similar. At least, I think it's similar. In that I haven't seen any of the subject matter I'm gonna review this month. I'm talking about the Disney Channel original movies. Now seeing how these starred in 1997, I'm not gonna lie, they were a little past my time, so I didn't grow up with any of these. Why are they worth talking about then? Well, because the Disney Channel original movies got so popular that it almost helped define a whole generation. Okay, not define, but it was a big part of it. It was to many kids what, say, Ninja Turtles was to me. Or He-Man, or Transformers, or any of these other silly things that a lot of people my generation grew up with. Yeah, they were ridiculous, but they also left an impact for some reason. Well, all through the month of December, I'm gonna take a look at these films and try to figure out why they were so popular, if they deserve to be so popular, and if they hold up as an adult, or were they only meant for kids? And even if so, were they really any good for kids? Now if you take a look, you quickly realize there are a ton of these movies that go way beyond how many days there are in December. So I'm only gonna try and do the most popular ones, and if there were ever any sequels to them. Did they deserve the attention? The popularity? Well, there's only one way to find out. I have no idea if I'm in for something great or something terrible, or both. I'm curious to see what a generation under me grew up with, and if it actually holds up at all. Some of these are even movies based on shows, I'll get an idea what kind of shows kids were watching too. Am I in for a wild adventure? Or nothing but pain? There's only one way to find out. This is Disney Summer, the Disney Channel original movies. Let's do this. So the very first film to ever premiere was in 1997 called Under Wraps. I'll admit I don't remember people really talking about this, but it is the very first one, so I think it figures to talk about now. From the story, Under Wraps sounds like the most phoned-in Disney Channel movie you can imagine. Three quirky friends get together and break into an old creepy house. They discover a mummy's tomb, and inside it, a mummy! And the mummy comes alive and starts running through suburbia not knowing where to go or what to do. Wouldn't you know it, a little friendship starts up, but some evil mobsters want them for themselves, and yeah. This sounds really friggin' stupid. But surprisingly, for such a lame and overdone setup, this can really be funny, creative, imaginative, and even have kind of a dark sense of humor. Yeah, no joke. Don't believe me? Just look at how it opens. A family is arguing around a dinner table. The little boy calls his sister a cow. It already starts off so delightfully mean-spirited. The father goes to do the dishes, but then a knife falls in the garbage disposal spinning around when a monster breaks through the window, grabs his head, and stabs it on the spinning knife in the garbage disposal! Holy shit! I can't believe this is a Disney Channel original movie starting off this way! Now, of course, it goes the direction you think it's going. It's not really happening. It's a movie they're watching. But even in the movie, the whole entire theater goes red like the gore happens. They're just not showing it. And that's a really creative way to kill somebody. This film starts off with already a really original way of killing somebody off. But it doesn't just stop there. The kids in this movie are super cynical. The lines they say to each other are almost like Simpson lines. Even though they can't swear or do anything that wrong, there is kind of this edge to them that reminds me a little bit of Monster Squad. It's hard to explain, it's kind of like this natural mean-spiritedness that most kids have at that age but for some reason aren't really shown on screen that much. Kids do throw insults at each other and they try to see if they can one-up one another. They talk about sleeping in the nude, they want to go inside this house where somebody died just because they can. They discover later that there's a key to get into the house and when they ask why they didn't use it, they're like, What's the fun in that? Breaking in is much more cool. It's that bizarre kind of kid logic I strangely enough kind of remember at that age. There's this line where this one boy asks what does celibacy mean and the girl says it means no chicks. He says he can never do that and she says, trust me, you'll get used to it. Okay, it's not shocking, but it's just that little extra that separates it from a generic Disney film. And on top of that, all the characters are strange, like really weird odd people. There's a guy who owns the weirdest bookstore that's covered in skulls and gore and he answers the door by pretending he has a knife stabbed in his back and he falls to the ground. How would that keep any customers? That would scare everybody away! But that's more important to him than actually selling anything. Even the characters at the fast food joints are kind of weird and odd. They all have distinct characters and a lot of them just focus on hurting this poor mummy. Every other second he's either being smacked, or pulled, or even burned. Look at this, his nipples are on fire! And this is at a hospital, too! Everything is just out to hurt this poor guy. 
Speaking of which, this is the same guy who is from Coach and Gargoyles, and he actually has two roles in this. He plays the mummy, who sadly doesn't have much talking or expression, but he still does okay. And then he also plays the guy who's dating the main kid's mom. He doesn't like him very much, despite him being very nice, and yeah, they're kind of doing like a Captain Hook thing, aren't they? We're both the father or father-to-be. And Supernatural character kind of represent that fear of what's coming forward, but then you see he gets used to the monster as he'll get used to the dad, and yeah, you know what? This actually kind of works. It's been done, but I think a lot of the stuff in this movie's been done, but they kind of playfully acknowledge it. Even when it gets really stupid at the end, where they have to fight off the phony gangsters, how do they do it? They pretend like their eyes are gushing out of their heads, and then they knock the person out and tie him up with intestines. I love this kind of stuff. You would never see this in a Disney movie. This kind of just barely G-rated humor tickles me in just the right way. It's not overly dark and aggressive to a point where it becomes awkward, but it's just enough. The downside is the second half does slow down a little bit and some of the laughs go a little quiet, but I thought the whole thing was going to be like that. For a good, I don't know, two-thirds of the movie, I was surprisingly kind of enjoying it. Okay, not loving it, but there were some laughs here and there. I don't know, I'm not going to act like this is anything great, but for a little Disney Channel movie, I thought it actually had more to it than it needed. If you're looking for that little kid Halloween movie that goes a little further than it needs to, with some memorable characters, weird scenes, and surprisingly funny lines, I say this is actually worth checking out. In the same way a kind of self-aware B-movie is worth checking out. Take a look for yourself and see if it's worth getting wrapped up in. From one Halloween movie with Under Wraps to another one with Halloween Town. But sadly, unlike Under Wraps, this is pretty much exactly what I thought I was going to get with a cheap, lame Disney Channel movie. I guess they made a couple sequels to this, but God help me if I can figure out why. This is stupid. This is the kind of movie you would see in Mystery Science Theater. It's filled with hokey acting, lame effects, and surprisingly not very creative ideas. That is to say, the initial setup is not that bad. Three kids are forbidden to go out on Halloween because the mother says they can't. But things start to turn around when their grandmother, played by the late Debbie Reynolds, literally flies in and says that she needs the mother's help. The kids over here follow the grandma and discover that she is, in fact, a witch. And they follow her on this magic bus to Halloween Town. And if you're anything like me, you're thinking Halloween Town is going to be something like Halloween Town, the one from Nightmare Before Christmas. Weird buildings, dark, creepy, odd, everything a little askew. But nope, it's a bright, cheerful place that just has a bunch of people in Halloween masks. Oh, I mean, uh, ghouls and goblins, ooh. But Halloween Town is in trouble because this evil bad guy, who kind of looks like a mix between the Grim Reaper and Jim Carrey's Grinch, and acts about as subtle. Welcome to my museum! <laughs> wants Halloween Town to take over the land of the humans so they don't have to live apart anymore. Actually, doesn't sound like that bad of a plan. I'm not sure why they're separate anyway. But nevertheless, the grandma tries to teach the kids how they can be little witches and warlocks to come together and stop his evil magic. Okay, so from a setup like this, obviously story is not going to be a biggie. This is an excuse to have some really creative images and ideas and characters and so on and so forth. And that's not for the most part what we get here. The writing's not especially imaginative, it just sort of goes by the numbers. Hey look, a ghost. Hey look, a werewolf. The acting isn't necessarily awful, but it's just bad enough. Like the 13-year-old is supposed to be odd and strange and a bit of a weirdo. Seeing as how Marnie likes weird stuff so much. She's got the weird part down pat. Halloween is like made for her. Okay, look and listen to this kid and tell me if you would get that. And how are we supposed to grow up if we can't explore the world, try new stuff, and take some risks? Uh-huh, no. Daria is a weird kid. The Monster Squad are weird kids. You're like the cheerleader from American Beauty trying to be weird but doing a really bad job at it because you're the everyday average kid. There's nothing odd about you. The brother is the typical geek with all the analysis and book smarts that he brings up at every single moment because that's all he is. 
Give me a good nature documentary any day. All that candy causes cavities and gum disease. Trees are important too, you know. Everyone's got their thermostat set to 68 degrees. Degrees, science, that's my entire character. Never seen that before. And the smallest one is so bad, they only give her a sentence at a time. Hell, sometimes just a word at a time. I was pretending. I wish luck would turn into a frog. It's the bad thing. The only one who's ever doing a good job is Debbie Reynolds. I don't know what it is. She acted like every single part she got was the role she always wanted to play. She just puts everything into it and she's 100% believable, even in such a silly idea. I don't like witches. They're mean and scary. Oh, no, 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 sweetheart. I mean, they're just like everyone else. Some are kind, some are mean. That's the way they use their magic. Aside from that, I'll give some credit to some of the creativity in the makeup. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're obviously masks, they don't look real, but they're kinda like the Evil Dead movies. You know they're fake, but they're very creatively fake. Some of them have really cool designs, and I especially love this skeleton taxi driver. So, first time in town for you kids? Look at this thing, look how expressive it is. It would have been so easy just to have a skeleton in a cap hat and just have the mouth move up and down, but look at this, the eyebrows have a lot of motion, the mouth is moving left and right as well as up and down, it's actually a really good effect. But then they ruin it with this line. It's probably animatronic, Disneyland's full of stuff like that. What, what are you doing you dick, don't ruin the illusion. That's like someone coming onto the Muppet Show saying yeah you're probably all puppets, most likely from the Jim Henson studio. Little douchebag? Once in a while, there's a joke that gets a little bit of a laugh, like I enjoy how the witch's microwave has boil and bubble and toil and so forth. There's a fun little segment where the kids have to get ingredients for a spell, like hair of a werewolf, fang of a vampire, and sweat of a ghost. How do they do that in this world? By going to a barber shop, a dentist, and a gym, of course. Leading to probably the film's best line. Ghosts are dead. Why would they worry about fitness? But aside from that, it's pretty empty. I mean, just look at this place. When I hear Halloween Town, I want to see something dark and creepy and whimsical, not just any other town with people wearing some masks. It's kind of like a mix between a bad Goosebumps episode and that really lame Babes in Toyland starring Keanu Reeves. The few creative elements are nice, but it's not enough to cover up the cheapness of both the writing and the budget. I suppose if you have like little, little kids, this is fine, or I don't know, maybe it did have more of an audience than I thought, they made a ton of sequels. But when you hear Halloween Town and you think of something more like what the cover looks like as opposed to this bright suburban sunny day, then I say this is a definite pass. It's Xenon, girl of the 21st century. And if you think that doesn't date it, take a listen to this. President Chelsea Clinton. Yep, that's the kind of on the nose writing we're gonna be dealing with here. Well, okay, looking at this, maybe it's supposed to be the late 21st century. That gives a bit of time. 2049, yeah. Definitely optimism at the height of foolishness. But whatever, it's children's fiction. What's the story? Well, Xenon, a teenage girl, lives on a space station and does all sorts of things that a girl that age usually does. Hang out with her friends, listen to bands, get in trouble, all that stuff. But when she sees that the biggest funder of the space station seems to be up to no good, she tries to call him out on it, but nobody believes her. As punishment for her actions, she's grounded. Literally. She's grounded down to Earth. Which she barely remembers because she left when she was in kindergarten. As you'd imagine, Earth and the space station are very different from one another, and she has a hard time fitting in. Her Aunt Judy is a little odd, the clothes are all different, people talk different. Even the food and gravity are off from what she's used to. But slowly over time, she starts to make friends, and they start to realize maybe all the things she was saying about the Thunder was true. As those evildoers try to track her down because she has some sort of secret disc, and ultimately she ends up trying to save her space station while also trying to get a dance with her favorite boy band. Yeah, it's pretty silly. As you probably imagine, there isn't really that much in this for adults. This is clearly made for a very target audience of, I don't know, let's say 5 to 11 year olds. Because of this, a lot of the storytelling and acting is a little over the top, but I have to admit, when I was that age, this is the kind of acting and storytelling I liked listening to. It is exaggerated, there are a lot of catchphrases, but the film does try to contribute a few interesting ideas and fun environments. 
The space station, for example, is a really cool design. I just love looking at it. I love these colors, I love these setups. Okay, it looks a little cheap, but it's almost like being on Deep Space Nine, except from the little kid's point of view. I always thought that'd be kind of a neat idea. But the nice thing is the fun stuff doesn't stop when she leaves the space station. Her interactions on Earth are actually kind of interesting. Because she's not very familiar with it, she thinks everyone constantly has to dodge tornadoes and earthquakes and sicknesses. And if someone grew up on a space station, that is probably what they would assume. They say that gravity on Earth compared to the space station is also 30 pounds heavier. And they demonstrate this very cleverly by just having her go on this bridge that's at an angle and they tilt the camera, and that's a very simple way of showing it, but it's also really effective. There's also fun contrast, like even though she constantly gets into trouble and can do all these cool things on the space station, she's afraid of horses. She's known as a risk taker back at home, but she's terrified of trying a burger. She even has good comebacks for these stereotypical bullies. Seeing how people on Earth and space stations dress different, this one girl goes up to her and asks if she's gonna be in a freak show or dressing up for Halloween. Her response? You win. It's the Halloween thing. Now, lend me that mask you're wearing and I'll have the most hideous major costume ever. Oh, snap! I love that. You think she's gonna go through the whole movie just with her head down, looking sad and stuff. But no, the first insult she gets, she throws it right back. I love that they played around with that a little bit. But on top of that, it has a clever way of demonstrating a very familiar lesson. It is a fish out of water story and about adapting, but it's a kind of adapting that a lot of kids that age can understand. It's moving from one location to another where the clothes are different and the language is different and tiny things you took for granted can suddenly get you in a lot of trouble. But by adding that extra element of having it in the future and on a space station, it makes it a little bit more interesting. It's more fun and creative, even if sometimes the effects are pretty laughably bad. Come on, these were embarrassing even by the standards back then. But while the effects don't look that great, they do still take the time to have a character be in a moment. While the characters don't look like they're really there, they feel like they're really there. The movie takes time to just focus on their reaction and play some nice music and feel the environment. And they do the same thing on Earth too, where you can appreciate the ocean and landscapes and such. I think this movie knows what's gonna be fun about it is the environment, and they let you as a kid enjoy it. Is it cliched? Sure. Can the characters get annoying? Yeah, sometimes. But if you imaginative ideas and visuals mixed with even a few good performances from the boyfriend and the aunt, give it a nice enough atmosphere where if I was the appropriate age they were aiming for, I would probably enjoy it. Not much in it for adults, but I don't really think it's meant for adults. It's meant for kids who need to learn about being out of place, but also about accepting new ideas and new environments. And this does have some imaginative ideas and environments. Most adults would fall asleep, but I think most kids would have a cheesy, but fun time. I start with can of worms. Just imagine you're channel surfing, and suddenly you come across this. Don't move and put your appendages behind your back! It meant nothing. Did he read you your rights? Time for an explanation! And it better be good! It will, officer. Of that I can assure you. Those are just the table scraps of insanity that this special has to offer. It's the craziest goddamn thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous and dumb, and not good, and I, I don't even have the words for it. The story, if you can call it that, centers around a kid named Michael. Just listen to a couple seconds of him. Thousands of spaceships bristling with, with force fields and weapons surrounded the planet. They knew most of them would be doomed. Doomed? Doomed. Yep, that's the kind of performance you gotta put up with this whole film. You see, Michael is a bit of a nerd, so much so that he believes he's from another planet. Yeah, not make-believes, believes-believes. He constantly tells stories to this little kid and he acts like it's real. He tells himself that he can't be, but he can't help but shake the feeling that maybe he is. But I'll put that on the back burner for about 40 minutes. Yeah, there's no talk of aliens or anything like that for 40 minutes in this hour and 20 minute movie. Instead we focus on how he sucks at football, yet the lead cheerleader of course falls in love with him, and asks him to help her put together all the decorations for the Halloween dance. He uses all his computer skills and nerdy technology to make it a big hit, but the bully sabotage it, causing him to run out in a panic. What does he do? He goes to his giant space satellite, you know, 
like every kid has, and sends out a message to the universe that he is being held there hostage and wants to be taken to another galaxy. Again, like most kids would. I fulfill life nullified by the ignorant and cruel indigenous population of Earth. Lightning strikes the satellite and he soon forgets about it until a dog voiced by Malcolm McDowell arrives telling him that he's from a non-profit organization that wants to take him to a world where he'll feel more comfortable. But wait, it gets stranger. Soon other aliens start to arrive for various reasons. One wants to make a lawsuit out of him and sue the Earth. Another wants to sell the rights to his story to make an intergalactic movie. Another wants to be his agent. It just gets stranger and stranger. But then things get really out of hand when one comes to kidnap him for a zoo, accidentally stealing his little friend. And they have to go in and save him while also saving one of the aliens he thought he was in the story he was talking about in the beginning. Yeah, it looks like they're real. How did he know about them? How does he know how to open their cage and use some of their devices? It is never explained. They never say whether or not Michael's an alien or a boy. They never explain how he got all this information. It just ends with him petting Malcolm McDowell dog behind the ears. So, um, yeah, this is exactly as goddamn insane as it sounds. I guess from the oddness of the story and kind of the satirical edge, you can maybe get a few jokes out of it. Maybe there's some possibilities for it. It's just so damn strange. But no, none of it goes together. The story is horrendous. The writing is ridiculous. All the acting is over the top. None of it makes any goddamn sense. The only thing kind of interesting about it is the design of the aliens. I mean, I had to give credit. These are some pretty bizarre are out there puppets. But aside from that, I have no idea what I just watched. This has got to be the friggin' weirdest thing Disney Channel has ever put on TV, and that's saying quite a bit. Even by kid movie standards, it's ridiculous. The first 40 minutes, almost nothing happens except you watch him get ready for this dance, and then the rest of it is all this talk about lawsuits and signing contracts and stuff that a lot of kids probably wouldn't follow it. And it's just, it's just stupid. It's so stupid. You just can't believe what you're watching half the time. The only way I can think to describe it is the Santa Claus versus the Martians of Disney Channel movies. It's not just bad, it's laughably bad. And I think even kids that watch it would know how dumb it is. I guess on that level it's kind of entertaining. I mean, how could anyone predict where any of this was going to go? But if you want something that's entertaining on, say, a kid's level, an adult's level, a satirical level, a charming level, or performances that don't look like Walter Benaziak doing Zack Snyder, then this probably isn't the movie for you. And if it is the movie for you, please kindly keep your distance from me. Thirteenth year, I guess Disney really had a thing about turning kids into mer people, didn't they? Well, kind of like Little Mermaid 2, this one is kind of as least interesting as that one was. Not to say it's awful, it's just not really anything. Which is a shame because again, I don't think this is that bad a premise. A mermaid is swimming with her young baby, but a man sees her in a boat. Afraid for her son's safety, she drops him off and tries to distract the man in the boat, only to have a couple, one of them played by Dave Coulier, pick him up, take him to the police, and when nobody claims him, they decide to adopt him. The mermaid mother surprisingly just kind of stays away for 13 years until suddenly the boy, named Cody, starts to notice certain changes. He's swimming faster, he's growing gills, he has... Electricity? Oh, and he can stick to walls? Um, yeah, and vampires sparkle. His parents don't know what to make of it. The doctor just says, it's puberty. Uh, yeah, second opinion much? Only his nerdy best friend can figure out what it is. He's turning into a merman. How does he know? Because his father is the one that saw his mother years ago. Oh, small world. The rest of the story is just him coming to grips with his powers, trying to find his real mother while also keeping his girlfriend, while not embarrassing himself, while also trying to make the swim team and the championships. Blah, 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 blah. It's about as generic as it gets. 
There's a ton of things that don't make sense in this movie. Like I said before, the mother staying away for 13 years. Come on, she couldn't flop onto the beach and get someone's attention or something. Just destroy the mystery. It's your freaking kid. Hell, she distracts the man in the boat by showing off what she is, and he's like, oh my god, I gotta prove mermaids are real and everything. What, she showed off to that guy? Why couldn't she show off to other people? Keep it a secret. Why is it even a secret? Why don't you use your electric powers that you suddenly have? Yeah, I guess they kind of make a connection to electric eels, but that doesn't explain why they can stick to walls. Everyone is just a little off, too. Like, the swim team makes fun of him because he always comes in second. What the wrong with you? He always comes in second. That's impressive. Even the girlfriend for his birthday just gives a picture of herself. That's strangely narcissistic. And then she just closes her eyes waiting for a kiss. Everything in this movie is just a little off. There's another scene where his hands are sticky and he's shaking them off and then the mother just starts doing it too and then the father comes in and starts doing it. What, what's even going on here? This isn't quirky strange. This is just strange strange. Even Cody's performance is a little strange. I mean, it's not laughably bad. I mean, he's not over the top or too goofy, but maybe that's kind of the problem too. He doesn't really stand out. He's just kind of boring. He's the every kid to a fault. You can't really imagine yourself in his shoes because he doesn't have much of a reaction. I don't know if he was written that way or directed that way, but it just doesn't come across as anything. The only thing I really took out of this movie, strangely enough, is the guy that sees the mermaid originally. You may recognize him from a few Sam Raimi movies like A Simple Plan, and even though he always kind of plays this southern redneck bumpkin, he always does this part really well, to a point where it's actually legitimately dramatic. The part where he's talking to his son about what he believes and he can't help it, and is he crazy, looking for other people crazier than him, it's actually kind of touching. I always kind of perk up every time he's in a movie, it's always interesting. But aside from that, when Dave Coulier is your next most credible actor, you kind of know you're not in a good spot. Like I said, I can't say this movie is terrible, it wasn't awful watching it, it's just kind of like watching nothing. It's really a shame. Not only is this an interesting idea, I mean, the ocean, underwater, fish life, I mean, it's interesting. But it's also unique that it took an idea that's usually meant for girls, you know, mermaids are usually girls, and gave it a little bit of a spin by making it a boy. You think these little touches would help it stand out, but it just kind of gets lost in the mix. I don't know if it was just an uninteresting script, or if there wasn't time to direct it in an interesting way, or shoot it in an interesting way, but it's mostly just forgettable. Aside from a few dedicated fans, it's unlikely this one's going to stay afloat for very long. So when going over the list for this year's Disney Simber, I knew I had to drop one of these two movies to make room. Smart House or Princess Protection? I asked people on my Facebook who grew up with these movies which one they wanted to see, thinking they would say Princess Protection because, hey, it's Disney and princesses, that's just kind of their thing. But overwhelmingly, everyone said Smart House. Not just picking that one, but praising that one. Like it was actually a legitimately good film. So I popped it in, take a look, and... Yeah, it actually kind of is. I mean, okay, it's corny, has bad effects, and it's clearly aiming for kids. But I found myself legitimately entertained by what was going on and even laughing quite a bit. The story centers around a family who, big shock, just lost their mother recently. The son has put it upon himself to take care of the household and has decided to enter a contest to win a smart house. A home where everything is taken care of by computer. They of course win and find that the house is actually quite perfect. Apart from a glitch here or there, it actually seems to do everything for them and seems quite pleasant. But when those glitches do happen, they have to call the inventor, who it turns out is sparking a bit of a romance with the dad. The son doesn't like this as he's still getting over the loss of his mother, so he decides to program into the computer, named Pat, that she should be more motherly, hoping the father won't see the necessity of dating. The computer not only complies, but over time, it gets obsessive. It looks up all the motherly things that mothers are supposed to do and does them times ten. She's strict, but also playful, enforces good morals, but doesn't always practice them when looking after her kids, and yeah, starts to see the family as her family. When everybody realizes Pet might be going too far, she suddenly turns herself into human form, a hologram projection that decides it's too dangerous outside, and so she decides to hold the family hostage. 
It's as crazy as it sounds, but in all the best ways. The writing in this movie, at least when it comes to the dialogue, is not necessarily the best, but they got good actors and a good director to really bring it to life. They can make unfunny lines seem legitimately humorous and take non-emotional scenes and make them actually kind of tearjerkers. The family is not a rotten family. They don't just throw insults at each other all the time like on a sitcom. They actually get along pretty well, and they're likable, and they have distinct identities. And again, I think a lot of that comes from the acting and the directing. The son, for example, in any other movie would be seen as unrealistic or strange. Why would he be obsessing over keeping the house clean and tidy and such? But the movie and the performances do a great job showing that it really is because he can't fill the void of his missing mother. He sees that when his father wants to date somebody else, it's betraying his mother. That's some heavy material for a Disney film to take on, but by God, they take it on, and they do it seriously. It isn't just the full house routine where you know, oh, this is where you hear the serious moment and you tune out and they just say those catchphrases. No, they really talk about it, and you really listen. Speaking of Full House, all of these characters and jokes could so easily fall into that category, being too corny and too nice. But there is enough conflict in their everyday lives, and of course with the computer and the missing mother, so it never really feels ungenuine. Katie Seagal as Pat is a perfect choice. Every time she talks, it's funny. It's a great evolution going from that robotic voice that could be hilariously obnoxious. Certainly, Angie, your boy, <laughs> your dog. Not to worry, Nick, my database was prepared by a team of nutritionists. To a gradually changing tone of her being this overly obsessed, even insane mother. Does it hurt like the dickens, baby? Nobody goes after my boy and gets away unpunished. And when she finally takes on human form, it's even better. Look at that evil smile, that's both funny and terrifying. It's interesting that this movie was directed by LeVar Burton, Geordi from Star Trek. This honestly makes too much sense. Not only did he act on Star Trek, but he directed several episodes. And if you watch Star Trek, you know that a lot of this centers around sci-fi technology, which often ties into the problems and conflicts that are happening on the ship. Say, a family coming to grips with the loss of a family member while the technology in their lives has created a conflict that ties into that struggle. This guy has had years of watching and directing stories like this, and he does it wonderfully here. The only problems I really have are nitpicks. Like there's a scene where Pat wants to torment a bully. In my opinion, it could have been a lot meaner and a lot funnier. There's also a scene where Pat gives a loving look to the boy at the end, even though it's clearly the same look that was done before and was meant to be evil that time. Little things like that can kinda get in the way along with some of the corny effects. But honestly, the story, the characters, and the acting really pull it through. I feel like everything that can and should be done with a kid's film about a smart house is done in Smart House. It's a movie kids can watch for the zaniness, but adults can also get a few laughs and even some dramatic moments out of it too. Not major ones, but just done well enough. The best way to put it, Smart House is a smart flick. Seeing how I thought the first scene on movie was charming enough, I expected the sequel, or Zequel, haha, <laughs> to at least be as good, if not better. As it starts off, it seems like it's gonna be good. It has a particularly funny opening where she sneaks into a control room and finds what she thinks is a game of Pong. Not only is it funny that she's blown away by a game like Pong, seeing how it's so simple and they just don't have games like that in the future, but it's made even funnier when you find out the paddles are actually the doors sucking stuff into space, even starting to get people involved in there. Okay, I thought we are in some good hands. But sadly, that's where the best stuff of the movie stops. You see, another authority figure is coming to the space station and, again, is threatening to close it down. To make things worse, his daughter is the girl that she didn't get along with in the first movie. And Xenon's been assigned to show her around and do whatever she wants. Even cut her food. Oh god, this is dumb. But Xenon can't think too much about that as she's put in a part of a ship to mostly just keep her out of trouble. It's a section that tries to track any signals for alien life. Wouldn't you know it, as soon as Xenon takes over, she hears a signal for alien life. But for some reason, nobody believes her. She said she heard this sound like a zoom, zoom, and what, they don't have a recording of it? They can't go back? They can't hear it again? This is the technologically advanced future? 
Naturally, this happens a couple times, and every single time she's the only one in the room and she has to tell everybody it happened again with nobody believing her. So she once again travels back to Earth, again spending the majority of the film down there, reuniting with her aunt, her best friend, and of course the girl she doesn't like who sneaks off with her for some reason. And they try to find the rock star from the end of the first film because they think that the message is actually his song and the aliens want to talk to him. Ugh, do you find this ridiculous yet? Don't get me wrong, the first Xenon was a silly film, but it had a little bit of a charm and creativity to it. This is just on repeat, except there's little charming about it. Most of the characters aren't even that likable. I hate how nobody believes her, I hate this girl that's supposed to be annoying, but instead of coming off as funny annoying, she's just annoying annoying. I hate the fact that she breaks up with the boyfriend at the beginning of the film and is treated like no big deal. No, actually it is a big deal, it kind of affects her, but not enough to pay him to have him come back in the movie. The musician gets annoying, the ant gets annoying, the parents get annoying, the general's annoying. Everything just has a slow, unimaginative feel to it. Even the aliens at the end when you finally see them just kind of look like rejects from the abyss. At times, it's even hard to follow. There's a lot of talk about what the aliens want and how they want them, and let me tell you, I watch a lot of Star Trek and even I couldn't follow this. How the hell are kids supposed to comprehend it? Even the layout of the scenes don't even make sense. Like the aliens finally come and everybody sees them and they're like, oh my god, life on a different planet. And then Xenon's still being punished and she's trying to tell them what's going on and they're like, where's your proof? What do you mean where's your proof? The aliens were just there. How can you still not believe her? But then they do it again. Yeah, the aliens just come by and flash things and yeah, didn't we just see this? Why was there that little scene of her getting balled out? Oh, what, is it so the annoying girl can finally stand up for her? You could have had that in an earlier scene. And truth be told, she's so unlikable, I'm still not quite on her side. When she sneaks off with Xenon, she leaves a letter to her father saying that she's been kidnapped. Freaking kidnapped! What the hell is wrong with these people? Okay, okay, so is this a terrible film? I guess not, it's just your run-of-the-mill bad. The characters are all morons, a lot of the moments seem recycled. The effects are a little better, I'll give it that. But aside from that, there's really not much to it. It's funny because this is the kind of film I assume the first Xenon would be like. You know, kind of lame, has aliens and some dumb technology that makes no sense and lame lines. But the first one kind of surprised me and I thought it was an okay kids film. Because of that, I was actually expecting more out of this one. And instead I got what I suppose I should have been expecting. Like I said, I'm not gonna act like it's the worst thing ever, but I definitely wouldn't take this trip to the stars anytime soon. The Irish is just my kind of silly. It's low budget, corny, knows it, and has a ton of fun with it. The story centers around a boy named Kyle, who seems to be the luckiest kid in school. He always finds money, he makes the finishing shot on the basketball team, everyone can't believe how things always go his way. But one day at an Irish festival, his lucky medallion is stolen, and suddenly all his luck seems to be disappearing. But not only that, a lot of other strange stuff is going on. His mother starts to talk with an accent, he's getting shorter, there's a little points on his ears growing, his hair's turning red, and on top of all of that, his parents refuse to tell him about his heritage. As you can guess, Kyle discovers that he's half leprechaun. And the medallion that was around his neck is actually magic that was keeping him human the whole time. So the search is on to see who stole the medallion, maybe one of the kids, or his angry grandfather, or who knows. On the surface, it doesn't seem like there's a ton you can really do with this story, but they seem to take advantage of it pretty well. Not only is there a fair amount of Irish lore, though I don't know how exactly authentic it is, but the writing has some good lines and clever ideas, and the actors all have good comedic timing. So many of these lines could easily crash and burn, but these actors are really trying and doing a good job making a lot of these jokes hit. I mean, come on, they were smart enough to cast Lassie from Psych in there, they must know what they're doing. The film doesn't go quite as far as an idea like this should probably allow. I mean, it would be nice to see more leprechauns, more of the fantasy world, and so forth, but for the most part, they just keep it in the real world. There's only one part where they actually travel, and even then it's at night and kind of hard to see. But I get the feeling this was kind of on a low budget, and honestly, for the budget they have, some of these effects are pretty good. This is 2001, and for a Disney Channel TV movie to have effects that look this good is actually kind of impressive. 
I should also comment that I like the way the movie is shot. I mean, it's not amazing, it doesn't try to show off or anything, but a lot of the shots always have a little bit of motion or an angle or a visual style to it. Again, it's nothing visually breathtaking, but you can tell they're constantly trying to say how can we make this shot look a little bit more interesting than just doing a medium shot or a straight on shot. They do have fun with those close-ups and tilted angles, but they never go too far to where it's distracting either. If I did have a problem, it's that the last third slows down a little bit. You almost think the climax is gonna happen in this one place and then suddenly it changes to a basketball game, and yeah, it's a basketball game. It's not like there's a ton of laughs you can get there. I mean, they try, but you know how these Disney movies go. They want to look cool during the basketball game, not exactly get a lot of laughs. But it more than makes up for it with some out-of-the-box thinking. For example, there's a scene where they're trying to find these thieves that stole a bunch of gold. They see a rainbow, and obviously they say, it must be at the end of that. Yeah, it doesn't work the way you think, where a rainbow lands and gold is just gonna appear. The gold is already there, and the rainbow follows that. That's kind of clever thinking. The movie is full of nice little touches like that that aren't exactly knee slappers, but still get a chuckle. Add on top of that actors that are legitimately charming, I enjoy watching, plus a story and direction that didn't have much to work with, but still did its best and kept my interest. I think this is a cute little adventure. Put on your green hats or whatever other Irish stereotypes you're fond of, and dance your way in for a viewing. It's Jet Jackson the Movie, based on the popular Disney Channel show that I haven't seen one episode of. So yeah, I'm kind of going into this a little blind, but I did a little research and here's what I discovered. Jet Jackson is an actor who plays a super spy called Silverstone. He enjoys that the show is a big hit, but he also just wants to be a kid again, so the production moves out from LA to North Carolina, where big time Hollywood people have to interact with small town everyday people and thus hilarity ensues. And that's about the most I know. The movie pretty much represents that, with Jet Jackson filming his show, going to school, possibly going out on a date. But he discovers he's getting tired of playing the part, so when asked to do another season, he's considering saying no. But things take a surprising turn when somehow Jet Jackson and Silverstone switch places. That's right, the real actor is in the fictional world, and the fictional character is in the real world. A super spy has to learn to blend in as a real kid, and the real kid has to save the world from Michael Ironside. Oh, how can any production go wrong with him in it? Okay, almost. On the one hand, I think this is a pretty clever idea. I mean, we've always seen stuff with the fish out of water stories or somebody switching places, but the idea of a fictional character switching places with a real life character, and not just focusing on one, but both of their lives as they try to blend in, is actually kind of interesting and a little funny. Just as Jed is getting sick of the character, he suddenly becomes the character. Just as Silverstone was trying to stop Chicago from blowing up, he then finds out he has to deal with people yelling at him for not doing the show anymore. Yeah, it turns out the town kind of depended on the show to create jobs and tourism, and yeah, it's actually a detail most kids' films would overlook. And both sides have some good comedy. Like when Jet discovers that New York is about to blow up by the evil bad guy, what does he do? He just goes around telling everybody, leave New York, leave New York! Yeah, that'll work. Silverstone also has a hard time putting the super spy away when he keeps seeing cast members who were villains in his world, tries to tell the cops, and when they don't do anything, he takes matters into his own hands. As humorous as this is, it does also take time to show the trouble both characters are going through. Each one trying to figure out what to do with their future, where they belong. Actual high school stuff that a lot of kids think about at around this age. There's even a prom scene where they don't show the prom. Holy smokes, has that ever happened in Disney history? There's a prom and yet you don't see it occur? Don't we have to hear the pop songs or see the girls in the latest dresses and, and what? This isn't going on? Wow, I'm kind of speechless. Well, that's all fine and good. I do have to question though, does this have a lot to do with the original show? Now, again, I haven't watched the original show, so I don't know, but looking at the summary of it, this doesn't seem like what the show was about. It seemed to go back and forth between showing the Silverstone TV series and Jet Jackson just living his everyday life. When you suddenly bring the fictional character to life, does that overstep what the original show was doing? I'm not sure if this is a really clever change of pace or if it's something that's so different that a lot of the fans wouldn't relate to it. So if you're asking as someone who grew up with the show, I'm not able to give you an answer. I have no idea if this is faithful or not. But as a 30-something who was forced to watch a Disney Channel kids movie, I thought it was kind of clever. I like that it's not all jokes, and when there are jokes, a lot of them work. 
I like that the Silverstone show does look like a lot of fun, but you're also interested in what's going on in Jet's life as well. So I think it's clever enough, though I have no idea what fans of the show would think of it. But I think there's enough smart writing and good acting to pull it off. If you're looking for a decent Disney Channel movie, this isn't a bad one to check out. Put on your backpack and your spy gear and take a look. It's time for more cheesy spookiness with Halloween Town 2. A far better follow-up from the last lame movie. With much better acting, much better effects, much better visuals. Does that make it good? Well, let's not say anything we can't take back. The Cromwells are finally throwing a Halloween party and even invite over their grandma. This is being done because the mother has no intention of the kids ever going back to spooky old Halloween Town. But that of course changes when an evil boy comes into the mix, steals the grandma's magical book, and uses it to literally suck all the color out of Halloween Town. Yep, all the crazy ghouls and weird goblins are now being replaced with normal people, bland attitudes, and a black and white landscape. To make things worse, the boy, which we now find out is the son of the villain from the last film, takes their grandma once again out of commission, meaning it's up to the kids to figure out how to set everything right. So for the most part, everything is a big upgrade. First of all, look at these effects. Okay, they're not phenomenal, but they're pretty damn good for that time period. The black and white filters are almost as good as Pleasantville, and they don't just turn everything black and white, there's still hints of color around, so it's not visually uninteresting to look at. And the color that is in there really pops a lot more. The acting is also a lot better. Unlike the last film where you're constantly trying to not snicker at how awkward the performances are, here, I don't know if they got a new director or just more time has passed for them to get used to their roles, but everybody seems much more on track. Okay, they're not phenomenal performances, but they're not in any way distracting. The story allows for a lot of fun ideas too. Like, did you know to undo a spell, you literally just say the spell backwards? That's kind of smart. And it also leads to some good problem solving, as they said a word that apparently reversed the spell so they know that if they say it backwards, that'll be what the spell is. So they have to retrace their steps, remember what they said, say the words backwards, it's actually kind of neat. There's also a place where all your missing items go. You ever miss the remote or your earring or something like that? This place in Halloween Town has it. But the owner got infected by the spell too, so he has everything clean and now they can find everything, which is against the idea it has to be lost in order to be found, and yeah, it's, it's kind of creative. The worlds themselves look a lot better. There's much more of a visual art design and it's more colorful and interesting. But the major downside is they don't go to that many places. A lot of the movie is them just staying in one spot, talking to each other, trying to figure out what to do. And because the spell is demonsterizing everybody, you don't really get to see that many monsters either. That is until the end. They have this really cool idea where the bad guy casts this spell and whatever mask they're wearing at the Halloween party, they become that creature. The monsters become monsters, the vampires become vampires, it's really neat. But the problem is this happens in the climax. Why didn't this happen in the middle of the film? A lot of these makeups are very creative and goofy and fun again. Why weren't we allowed to see them more? As cheesy as the makeup was in the first film, they were at least creative and allowed us to see a lot of them. Here, it's all kind of kept until the last couple minutes. And they're cool, but for a movie called Halloween Town, I expect to see a little bit more Halloween imagery. So I guess that is the one thing the first film has over this one, is that it does have a little bit more variety in locations and weird makeup designs and so forth. But for everything else, this movie does things a lot better. The ideas are more interesting, the acting is more interesting, the visuals are more interesting. I feel like they got a bigger budget to work on this, but they still had a lot of time restraints, so they had to move things around, and maybe they only had certain locations for a certain amount of time, and I don't know, maybe not, but that's what it feels like watching it. Though they're given a lot more, you're still always made aware of the limitations. But for the most part, I think they did the limitations okay. At least better than the last one. Would I watch it again? No. Is there anything really in it for adults? Not much. But as kids' TV movies go, I think it's got enough to be imaginative. Not a glowing review, but a positive one. If you got a kid that's interested, just like Halloween candy, it's perfect junk food.
let's take a look at Cadet Kelly! Yeah, it's pretty obvious I'm not the target demographic for this film, but for the target demographic, I think this is a perfectly serviceable little flick. An artsy little free spirit who likes to hang with her divorced mom and dad, but gets a little surprised when she finds out that her mom is getting remarried to Gary Cole, playing the role of... Oh my god, I think he's just called Sir. Do we ever know his real name? Let me IMDB that. Oh my god, he's just called Sir! Anyway, as you probably can tell from that name, he takes the military very seriously. So not only does Kelly have to move away from her school of alternative learning, you know, where they sit on beanbags and can do assignments whenever they want, and, you know, one of those super liberal schools, and suddenly has to go to boot camp. Honestly, it's not made entirely clear why, I guess because the stepdad is there, or maybe she got in trouble a lot? Well, it doesn't look like it. I don't know. The focus is on Kelly trying to adapt with her drill sergeant, Jessica, played by Kim Possible star Christy Romano. She of course doesn't fit in, claiming that her old school was a lot different and everybody's too rough. Why, it's almost like this is military school or something. But through a lot of goof-ups, understandings, and misunderstandings, she'll figure out there really is something to all this strictness, and her mother and stepdad will also figure out how to adapt to a changing world. On the surface, this sounds pretty generic, and yeah, a good chunk of the time it is. But there are little touches that make it stand out a little bit more from this kind of story you've heard a million times. For example, I like that she comes from this really open school where they do, like, arts and crafts and are super gentle. That makes a much better contrast and understanding of why she doesn't fit in. The family dilemma is also interesting, too. The father is strict and sometimes says the wrong things, but he's by no means a bad guy. He, like Kelly, is trying to understand what's the best route to take in terms of this family, and it's totally identifiable. I also like how nobody is 100% right or 100% wrong. Kelly does get in a lot of trouble, and she's properly punished for it, resulting in emotional scenes that a lot of the time kind of feel genuine. When Hilary Duff cries, it feels like she's really crying, and when the parents look confused or screwed up, you can tell it means a lot when they did something wrong. There are definitely problems, though, and a lot of them center around the Jessica character. Christine Romano is a very talented actress, I just don't think she was the right pick for this part. This is supposed to be someone tough, controlling, and in charge, and she just kind of looks like she's trying to play a role of someone being tough, controlling, and in charge. She just kind of seems snooty and pissed off, not really commanding authority. And I get it, Kelly's supposed to wear her down and get to her humanity, but she just doesn't feel like a genuinely intimidating character that needs to be softened up. There's also some strange issues with Kelly and her hitting on the same boy, and even at the end, he doesn't really choose which one he's gonna go with, and I don't know, it's more uncomfortable than charming. And yes, by the way, that is Iceman, or boy. And yeah, like I said, I never really got why she's going to military school. I don't know if I missed something, but I feel like that's kind of a big decision, and should probably be made very clear why this is happening, seeing how it's the whole focus of the film. But again, you could argue that's not really the film's intent. Its intent is trying to show a girl adapting to this new world and, to its credit, making this new world seem different but also impressive. We see movies like Stripes where the goofballs go to boot camp and all sorts of crazy things happen and oh, isn't that zany? But I like that this film looks like it legitimately respects the military. There's a lot of impressive marching and techniques and they look legitimately disciplined and even cool while doing it. I'll accept the final number in the competition. I don't know, they're building this up as like a big deal and they have to work together in order for this to work and they need passion and inspiration and what, they can use ribbons now and play pop songs and even if that's true, it's edited in such a way that they play scenes twice or speed it up and then slow it down and that's really cheating and it looks lame. The scenes before were so impressive, why did you have to dumb it down like this? I don't know, maybe they didn't have time to rehearse it well enough so that it looked incredible, but I felt like this was a cheap way out. However, I do big time give credit to the ending. Without giving too much away, not everything wraps up in a neat little bow. I really like it when a kid's film shows not everything is 100% happily ever after. Shit happens, you have to deal with it, and you know what? You still count your blessings and look on the bright side. I think that's a better message than always do your best and everything will always turn out your way. So yeah, would I put this on again? No. Would I check it out first time? Probably not. But for an adult who had to sit through this, I think it gets across the right messages. Sometimes subtle, sometimes too on the nose. Cadet Kelly passes with... Okay, Colors.
I've never seen one episode of Even Stevens. All I know about is that Shia LaBeouf is in it and a lot of people find it annoying. Well, now we have the Even Stevens movie! Shia LaBeouf is in it and I find it really annoying. I have no idea if this is an accurate representation of what the show was like, but if it is, I'm glad I skipped it. I can't say like this is one of the worst comedies I've ever seen because, you know, the Wayans are still working. There's plenty of other comedies that like hurt me and get under my skin. This is just kind of dumb. The story centers around the Stevens family trying to figure out what they're gonna do over summer vacation. Looking like they're gonna drive each other up the wall, a travel agent, played by Tim Meadows, offers them the chance to go to an exotic island totally free. The Stevens, not exactly being the brightest family, agree without asking if there's a catch. Of course there is, it's all secretly a reality show. A prank show that secretly focuses on making any family's life who's on it a living hell. They rig it so it looks like they destroy a house, anger the natives, and thus have to go through several punishments, survive on their own, and get through without murdering each other. On the surface, this sounds like a funny idea. The writers definitely know the more they can make the characters suffer, the funnier it'll be. But sadly, a lot of it just has awkward timing, weird jokes, annoying sound effects, sped up action, weird characters just doing weird things because it's weird. But none of it is done in a crazy enough way to get a laugh like in Ren and Stimpy. But none of it is done in a smart enough way like Malcolm in the Middle. We just kind of watch scene after scene of joke after joke, bomb after bomb. I guess I can give it this, when a joke misses, it doesn't hurt to sit through it. It's just kind of dull and lame, and usually followed by a bad sound effect. I can't really blame the actors, I mean, they're doing their best, and sometimes they do get a laugh. I mean, these are really good shouters. I mean, like, every other line is a shout, and by God, they do it pretty well. But aside from an occasional giggle here and there, there's not much to it. I was kind of surprised to find that the climax did get legitimately humorous. The sister goes insane and chases after the brother, all while the reality show people are watching it trying to figure out if they can get sued for it. On top of that, when they do figure out as a reality show and try to figure out a way to get them back, it's a pretty funny payoff. One that has a lot of punchlines that just keep going and going and get funnier and funnier. Even the epilogue got funnier, like when Shia LaBeouf is talking to his sister. I feel like the rest of the movie is trying to have that randomness and that wild energy. And while the energy is definitely there, particularly in the actors, again, you can tell they're trying their all, it just doesn't feel like it's guided in the right direction. I was mostly just sitting there bored out of my mind, thinking of funnier jokes they could have put in place of the ones they had. So do I hate it the same way other adults hate it, even Stevens? I can't go that far. Like I said, there's definitely an effort being put in. But it's almost like there's this awareness that, oh, we're making this for kids, so we have to make it a little dumber, a little slower. Put in sound effects and god annoying music. I mean, really friggin' annoying music. Elements like that may seem minor, but they can make a big difference in getting a laugh or no laugh. For me, I did get a few laughs, but definitely not enough for me to recommend it. Did that annoy the everlasting piss out of you? Well, then you're really gonna hate Cheetah Girls, the most obnoxious of these Disney Channel films I've seen so far. Jesus Christ, is this film annoying. Imagine the Gem and the Hallgrans movie mixed with the Mamma Mia movie. Yeah, it's that bad, that manipulative, and that annoying. Look, I tried to give these Disney Channel movies the benefit of the doubt. They're for kids. You gotta kinda look at them from a different point of view. But I swear to God, I have never shouted shut up so many times at a screen in my life. It's so ear grating, so pandering, so... Okay, let's just see what it's about. Four girls named Aqua, Bubbles, Chanel, and Doe, yeah, that's the names they go by, perform at a kid's birthday party, though you would never guess it because they just sing to the floor half the time like there's a wide-angle lens there and move like they're being edited, and yeah, it's almost like this is trying to be more of a music video than a coherent story. But whatever, Disney kids fantasy, we'll give them a little leeway. Bubbles, okay, I'm gonna call her by her other name because I think of the Powerpuff Girls when I hear that. Galleria, played by Raven, wants her band, the Cheetah Girls, to compete in this big contest. Apparently a lot of the winners go on to get record deals and so on and so forth. 
When auditioning for the contest held by this teacher that just seems to like to quote other songs, a record producer just happened to drop on by, saw them perform, and said he wants to make them stars. But her mother says they're not ready. They're just kids, she says, and shouldn't get attention this fast. Even though they were entering a contest that would get them that attention that fast. After a little bit of an argument, the mother finally agrees and the girls go to be made stars. But the big bad music label doesn't want to represent cheaterific girl power. They just want to do what's popular and change their image and their songs and totally redo everything. But wait, that's not the cheetah girl way! Apparently this doesn't matter that much though because Galleria is already getting a really big ego and thinks she's in charge of everything. No, really, like to an unlikable degree. It's kind of amazing how self-centered and punch in the faceable this character can be. This causes the girls to kick her out of the group and thus she has to sulk and think about where she went wrong. Will the big bad music company get their way by having the girls wear animal masks because uh, some chart somewhere said that was cool? Or will the girls get back together to use their own manipulative marketing to sucker people? Okay, so you've heard this story a million times, it's bullshit, let's move on to the other problems. 50% of this movie is just giggling, screeching, yelling, and saying catchphrases. Cheetah! 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 Oh! Oh, except for one dramatic scene where a girl admits she lives in a foster home and it's actually like a tear-jerking scene that comes right the hell out of nowhere. Um, yeah, don't actually try to be a real movie about the problems of growing up, you piece of shit. Right after that scene, it goes into them trying on different clothes and looking all glamorous and singing about how they're the real deal. There isn't one iota real about you. You are fake. You are manipulative. You are everything you're claiming this big, bad music industry is trying to turn you into. Just because before you do a song, you self-righteously shout girl power. No, really, they do that. Now you're talking. Cheetahs, girl power. Ooh, she's standing up for girls everywhere. It's a movement, guys. A movement about being the independent artist when really it's all about getting attention. You are the most attention-hungry little pains in the asses I ever saw. You can't even walk on the street without giggling, shouting, doing a dance number, and having a crowd circle around you all applauding because, wow, wasn't that amazing? Oh, this just happens all the time. We're just walking down the street, we start dancing, and oh, we can't help it if we're incredible. Yeah, fuck this shit. This is all just an excuse to get a band going, which, by the way, this was a band. A very successful one, too. So, kind of a dumb question, but why the hell didn't you just be a band? Why did you have to make this dumbass movie? H have you ever seen movies based on dumbass bands? They're usually really bad, but they come after the band. I mean, you can sing, you can dance, at least in that way that's probably auto-tuned and edited and such, but, you know, that's the business, I get it. Kids want their band, and that's clearly what they want here. They want the band, they want the girls, they want the singing, then the songs. But that's not what we get. We get this loud, dumb, obnoxious movie trying to make you think it's about being independent when really all they want to do is control you. They want to control what you buy, what you listen to, and yeah, I know that's kind of the business and marketing, and I've been a victim of it too, and even proud of it in some ways. But the way this one has the balls to mock what it is obviously doing itself, and not being clever about it, in fact being lazy about it, and instead replacing what could be challenging commentary with just giggling and squeeing and dumb lines on top of cliches on top of cliches, all wrapped up in one of the worst endings I've ever seen in these damn films. Which, yeah, let's talk about that. I'll give you a fair warning, I'm going into spoilers, but Jesus Christ, who gives a shit if any of this is spoiled? Whatever you've been warned. After the girls split up, Galleria loses her dog. Yeah, it's pretty much her fault, and the dog gets stuck in something. I don't know, a sewer. Someplace he can't get out. She calls the police. There's like this big major deal about it with this crowd all getting together, news groups are there. Hey, come on, it's a damn dog stuck. But of course the girls see it and rush down to the rescue because, of course, the dog will only come out if they all sing together. Okay, this is dumb enough, but then the boyfriend says, hey, now that the girls are all together, maybe you can make up. And how do they make up? Through singing, of course. 
And by the way, this is not a musical, like in High School Musical, where the songs are worked into the story. No, no, they were just singing songs when somebody says sing a song, like for their album or whatever. But suddenly she starts singing to her girls, they start singing back, I'm kind of amazed you can hear each other in the middle of New York. And hey, since we got a crowd, let's do a totally choreographed musical number on the spot! How the hell would that crowd even hear them? How the hell would it be this organized? Just, okay! As if this wasn't dumb and stupid enough, they all go to that contest which appears to be over and they miss because yeah, they were getting the dog and everything. You see the empty theater, people leaving, it's clearly over. But wait, the teacher comes out to make an announcement that the winners, but, but, but wait a minute, it's clearly over, there's nobody in the theater, what the, why are you announcing the winners now? But screw that, it gets dumber, the winners are the Cheetah Girls for that dance they just did outside, even though they didn't make the competition, they didn't enter, they win! Yeah, sorry all the other groups that worked really hard and got the sound equipment together and showed up on time, you know, stuff that musicians are supposed to do. All your responsibility doesn't mean shit because these four little idiots did dance in the back, mainly because one of those idiots lost her dog and the other idiots came together to say, hey, we were all idiots. You are all idiots. You're idiotic idiot idiots. <sighs> Why wasn't this just a band? It would have been fine. This is a terrible kids film. It's insulting. It's degrading. There is so little passion or need to actually give you a story or characters or meaning. It is just an excuse for a controlled industry to advertise their band while saying a controlled industry advertising your band is bad somehow. This one was tough, guys. It was so hard to get through. You can have your fluff, you can have your junk food, but even junk food has to taste good. This just tastes like a screeching slap in the face, trying to pretend it has a meaningful message. <sighs> if you grew up with it, great. We all know why you watched it. You watched it to hear the songs and see them dance and find a reason to go see their concerts. Okay, cool. I'm sure their concerts were fine. It's debatable whether or not this is so manipulative that it's bad for kids. I would actually kind of make an argument it is. But I've seen kids' films that have much worse messages and done in far worse ways. But as Disney Channel movies go, this is the one to be for hatred. I couldn't stand it. I hated every embarrassing, humiliating, ear-bleeding moment of it. If you want a better experience, buy their CDs, listen to their songs. That's what they're meant to be doing. But if you want an actual good kids' movie, I say throw this hunk of dead meat to the cheetahs. Finally, a Disney Channel movie based on a property I'm somewhat familiar with. Kim Possible, A Sitch in Time. I was just around the age where I wasn't really watching kids' cartoons that much. I was around late high school or early college. But when I saw people like John DiMaggio, Nicole Sullivan, and Ricardo Montalban were attached, I said, eh, maybe I should check this out. And of the few Kim Possible shows I saw, I found myself actually enjoying it. But then again, that was a long time ago. Is it possible years later, now that I'm older, I find that Kim Possible isn't as funny as I remember it? Well, I'm glad to say, no. It's not only funny, it's even funnier. This is an incredibly funny, character-driven, energized, and just downright fun film. Kim Possible, voiced by Christy Carlson Romano, man, she did a lot for the Disney Channel, didn't she? Is bummed out because her sidekick and dude in distress, Ron Stoppable, God, how can you not love these names, is moving to Norway. He still insists that he can show up to help with the missions, but being so far away, he's constantly showing up late. That of course doesn't help when a good chunk of Kim Possible's worst villains band together and say, hey, we're gonna take over the world with time travel. They use this ancient monkey statue that has magic to travel through time, and... Yeah, that's kind of it. I'll be very honest, this is not a very story-based movie. It's pretty much just the idea that the bad guys from the show can travel through time, the heroes can follow, and just all the strange and weird things that come from it. They try to go back to Kim Possible in kindergarten, where they just make fun of her. They then go to her high school, where they try to make fun of her some more. One of the villains steals it for her own and decides to use it to her own advantage. All while Ron's naked mole rat with the voice of Michael Dorn comes from the future to warn them of the dangers? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 
it's made very obvious early on that the focus of this movie is not going to be telling an emotional or gripping story, it's just having an excuse to put a bunch of funny scenes and jokes together. But thankfully, all those funny scenes and jokes are driven entirely by the characters who are all hilarious, resulting in a lot of legit laugh-out-loud moments. Watching these Disney Channel movies, I can probably count on one hand how many times I actually verbally laughed out loud. With this one, though, it entered the double digits. This is funny writing. Done by funny actors. Some random actors, in fact. Michael Clark Duncan is in this, Kelly Ripa, Dakota Fanning, Vivica A. Fox, the list of oddness goes on. But they're all great, and they know how to make this already funny writing be even funnier. This is the kind of comedy that makes me laugh the most, the satire of superhero secret agent stuff. But also while making fun of the flaws, throwing in some reality, but also throwing in some surreality that makes it just so crazy and zany. I could listen to the villains in this movie bicker forever. I love the alliance of convenience. I love that they all legitimately don't get along, but they have to in order for their evil plans to work, and even then, they're always trying to backstab one another. Just listen to them argue about putting the monkey statue in its place. It's hilarious. Rock beats paper. <laughs> hey, you daft man. Paper beats rock. Oh, come now. How can flimsy paper possibly beat the raw density of stone? The action is also a lot of fun. There's something about the way it's animated that's really energized, and you kind of feel every punch, every swing, every dodge. It's kind of like the dialogue, where everything is just so quick and so fast, you almost don't have time to catch up to it. And because of that, they try a lot of various jokes. Some work, some don't, but the ones that don't work are quickly forgotten and replaced by the ones that do work. It's just so fast and well edited, it doesn't give you a time to remember when there was a bad joke. Now, while most of the people watching this are probably aware of the show, some might be asking, do I have to be aware of the show or know anything about it in order to watch the movie? For the most part, no. It helps if you know, but you can quickly catch on to what it's about. The characters are so well-defined and so funny that you ease up to them very quickly. And like I said, the movie is not really focused on any kind of drama or story-driven turmoil. Which I guess in some respects could be a turnoff to some people. This is kind of like Big Trouble in Little China or Evil Dead 2 or even the Lego movie. It just kind of exists to have a bunch of jokes that move really fast, are thrown at you super fast. And when you're done, you're left with a lot of really funny moments and a lot of really funny characters, but not really a heavy weight to anything that's happened. And it just kind of goes from one crazy thing to another crazy thing. If you're on board for the ride, it can be a lot of fun. If I absolutely had to nitpick, I'd say maybe Kim Possible is a little bit of a blank slate. She doesn't really have a ton of character, but it's kind of like Superman, that's not exactly the point. Kids are supposed to imagine themselves in the role, going on these adventures and fighting these bad guys, and she does it great, has all the one-liners, and is popular while doing it. Ron Stoppable at times can have a voice that's a little grating, but mostly his jokes hit bullseyes. Let's be honest though, what this movie clearly likes, as well as the show I'm assuming, are the villains. They're weird, but funny. They're powerful, but they're losers. They're in control, but they're always bickering. They steal the show whenever they're on screen. So yeah, even if you're a fan of the show or have never even heard of it, I'd still recommend this movie. If you haven't seen the show, it might take a little getting used to what's going on, but you'll catch on real quick. It's nothing great, like I said, the story isn't really that much to write home about, but it's just fun. It's a fun, fun film. I found out recently it's the same people that did the Buzz Lightyear show and movie, and you know what? That was really funny too! I actually really want to look into these shows! I don't know if they're on DVD or if I have to watch them another way, but I say it's worth it! I say there's a lot of talented people behind this. They're creative, they're humorous, they have memorable characters. This is certainly a mission you definitely want to accept. Xenon 3, or Z3 as the kids call it, no, I was not a kid when this came out and I still know no kid ever called it this, is the final and by far the worst in the epic Xenon trilogy. The first film was cheesy, but creative and made use with what it had. The second film was a serious downgrade, but definitely tried to keep the spirit of the first. The third just doesn't seem like it gives a shit. At all. You can feel every moment what an obvious cash-in this is. Not that the first one wasn't trying to do that either, but it was trying to tell a story first. 
This feels like it wants to just follow studio notes and then tell a story. If there's time. Xenon is staying with her aunt and uncle trying to pass a driving exam so that she can enter a competition to the moon. Yep, it's one of those common space driving mountain climbing competitions that, as far as I know, doesn't really have a prize of much worth. And seeing how she can't parallel park yet can somehow win this competition shows that she's clearly ready. But she can't do this without a cute little kid sidekick and her obvious ploy for a spin-off Xenon movie that never happened. This is her little cousin, adopted by the aunt and uncle, and of course, happens to be obsessed with her. Dresses like her, talks like her, and, much like this movie, is entirely pointless. Yeah, you could cut her out from this flick and you wouldn't miss a thing. It's like looking at Dr. Evil and Mini-Me, it's just weird and unpleasant. But something seems to be up as some sort of weird silver dust seems to be sabotaging the other players, forcing her in the lead. She, of course, has no problem with this and is enjoying her lead. When her friends finally call her out on what a douche she's been, she just shrugs, eh. But things might get complicated when this handsome boy she has a crush on is protesting anyone going to the moon because... I don't really know if they explained it, they didn't explain it very well or clearly. But soon Xenon doesn't want any people on the moon either because the moon spirit, <laughs> yes, I, I'm not even kidding is the one who's been using the silver dust to get in contact with her because she feels she's the only one who can tell them to leave the moon because she just doesn't like them. Oh, and she's not some formless being or some elegant looking ghost. No, she's just a goth girl. The moon is a goth girl. I have so many questions. She tells Xenon to kick everybody off the planet and when she doesn't want to, she forces her to go down on the ground and throw her up in the air. And yeah, she's just kind of a bitch. But Xenon, for some reason, sees her as the hero and decides to tell everybody to get off the moon. But first she has to win her friends back by apologizing. Oh wait, they forgive her without her having to do a damn thing. If you think that's not enough to show how little this movie cares, remember that rock star from the other movies? He's in this again, except played by a totally different actor. And what a shock, he's entirely pointless. I think he brings a car that can help transport them. That's it. I remember the movie felt so long in getting itself going that when I checked how long it was, I found I was only 10 minutes until the end. Yeah, it was so not interesting that I assumed the real story hadn't gotten started yet, and by God, we were actually near the end. I cared so little because it feels like the movie cared so little. Everything feels like it's there because producers just looked at some charts, saw what was popular, and threw it into this movie. Remember how in the last one she discovered aliens? Freaking aliens? Where did they go? As bad as the second one got, it at least felt like something was on the line. Something major was going on. It just wasn't being done very well. In this one, what do I care if they leave the moon? It's just one little pain in the ass that's yelling and screaming, and you know what? Screw her! I want to live on the moon! The other two Xenon movies seemed about exploring possibilities, space travel, all that stuff. This is like, hey, you want to see this cool idea? Neither do I. Bye! Why does this moon spirit even need Xenon? She's constantly grabbing people, throwing them up in the air. She can take form whenever she wants. There's this one scene where the guy's like, well, if this moon spirit is real, you better show us some proof. And sure enough, she shows up and starts flinging people around. Why couldn't you do that before? Why couldn't you talk to these people before? I know it seems stupid getting upset over Xenon 3, but the first Xenon, for as silly as it was, actually had something good in it. It felt grounded in a certain reality, a childish one, but still a reality. And it was about characters adapting and learning things. This is just life lessons you learn on the back of a Happy Meal box, thrown in with effects that somehow seem worse than the first one. Uh, this movie, as crazy as it sounds, is surprisingly kind of forgettable. Aside from the crazy-ass moon spirit, which was just so bizarre I couldn't forget it for the life of me, everything else is kind of just in one ear and out the other. Nothing seems relevant enough to make an impact. It just seems relevant enough for you to remember that Xenon's a thing that you're supposed to like. Well, seeing how they never made another one, I'm assuming that kids were starting not to like this anymore. And with writing like this, it's no wonder. Is it annoyingly bad? No. Is it Cheetah Girls worthy? Not even by a long shot. But it's pointless, dumb, and lacks any passion that the first one had, or hell, even the second one had. I'd say watch it only if you want to finish the movies off, but if not, you can lose this one in any wormhole.
You might think I've seen a lot of the show Proud Family based on what I said at the beginning of my Disney Afternoon review. Who's dissing the Proud Family? Nobody dissing the Proud Family while I'm around! But the truth is, I've never really seen any of those shows, that was more just to make a joke work. I am somewhat aware of what Proud Family is, though. If I visited someone that had kids, that was always a show that was on in the background. So I know a little bit about it. There's a girl named Penny. That's it. Yeah, I don't really know too much else outside of that. The reason I bring this up is because I'm not exactly an expert on whether or not the Proud Family movie is faithful to the Proud Family show. I just kind of assumed the show was kind of like Goof Troop or its suburban antics mixed with cartoon zaniness. But let me tell you, if it's anything like the film I just saw, this must have been one of the craziest shows out there because this movie was weird. But luckily though, in all the best ways. It opens with probably the strangest mad scientist I've ever seen in anything. He has a nose that keeps falling off and his master plan is to create a race of peanut people. Yeah, peanut people. He even has little peanut sidekicks. The problem is when he makes these peanut people, they don't last very long. But he comes across the Proud family whose father, named Oscar, is working on a food preservative that multiplies food. Uh, yeah, this never comes back again. <laughs> But it also makes the food taste awful, so the higher-ups don't listen to him. <laughs> you got something that can multiply food and you're getting rampant just because it tastes bad? Come on, take that! You can work with it somehow! But the mad scientist is happy because that preservative he can use to preserve his peanut people. So he sets up a phony contest that he says the family won and flies them out to his island. That seems to be a thing in these Disney Channel movies, isn't it? But things of course go loony as Oscar discovers the mad scientist scheme and he makes clones of the family. The clones end up going back to their town, accidentally taking the real Penny, and the real family is stuck on the island with Clone Penny. Absolutely none of them are aware that they have the wrong Penny. But the real Penny actually seems to like the clone father, but is confused why her mother is suddenly talking like a gangsta teen. Come on, little sister. What's the phone one want on Oscar? She get phone. And also puzzled why her dad suddenly has an obsession with hot dogs. And so are we for that matter. Without giving anything away, the story goes so insane and so ridiculous that it actually starts to make sense. They actually do have a reason why the mad scientist is obsessed with peanuts and when it's revealed, it's so absurd you can't help but kinda buy it. Maybe that's the best way to explain this movie. So crazy that you can't help but enjoy it. All the characters are legitimately charming and likable. I especially like hearing Tommy Davidson again. I don't think I've seen him since In Living Color. I remember he had such this great energy and this fast way of talking, and it's great to hear him in the father character. If anyone's moving out of here doing whatever they want, it'll be me! Hey, of course I was bringing you with me, honey. <laughs> the animation ranges from cheap to impressive to cheaply impressive. It's not like it has a ton of motion, but the still shots that they choose to freeze on have a real Chuck Jones quality to them. They're just great poses and great expressions. Even if they're not moving, they feel alive. They have these great designs that really lend themselves to being bent and twisted and kind of like a good comic strip where even though they're frozen, you can sense the movement that led them to that pose. It's actually very cleverly done. There's also kind of a nice connection between Penny and her father. They have a bit of a falling out early on, but I like that the story doesn't necessarily take it in all the places you think it's gonna take it. Oh, the clone dad is gonna be too mean as she realizes what a good father she had, right? Actually, no, she really likes the clone dad. It takes a really long time and a long series of circumstances to make her realize how important her real dad is. Again, it's strange, but it somehow really works. So again, is this movie representative of what the Proud family is about, or is it too zany or not zany enough? I'm not really sure. All I can say is I had a lot of fun watching this movie. I like the crazy story, I like the adorable characters, I even like how the animation cuts corners, but in such a creative way. A way that surprisingly looks great and leads to a lot of great line work. Bizarre? Definitely. But also definitely a lot of fun. When I hear the names Tia and Tamara, the first thing that comes into my head is the opening of their show Sister Sister. It had these annoying drawings of these crying babies and this obnoxious theme song where they shout SISTER SISTER! And it was grouped in with usually some bad gimmicky family shows. So like a fair amount of people, I always kind of associate them with being gimmicky and annoying, but honestly, when you watch the show, it's not that bad. 
The two of them had good comedic timing, and they had a good supportive cast that was funny as well. The only thing that got annoyingly old outside of the intro is whenever they would do anything in unison, like say stuff at the same time, or gasp at the same time, or squee at the same time. But if I have to be honest, as family shows go, especially leaning towards kids' entertainment, it was fine. Twitches is the exact same thing. There's some funny, creative stuff on top of some corny and gimmicky stuff. And at the center of it are these two actresses who have grown their comedic timing over the years, can even do the dramatic stuff pretty well, and can surprisingly carry a film. Apart from, again, when they have to do anything in unison. Like say, go Twitches! Go Twitches! It's our birthdays! Ugh. Like Sister Sister, the movie focuses on the twins being separated at birth, only to accidentally bump into each other years later. Or was it an accident? This bickering couple, who honestly gets more laughs than they probably should, are kinda like their guardian angels. They watch them over the years, make sure they don't get too much in trouble, but they alter their courses so that they'll eventually meet in a particularly enjoyable joke where they have to keep dropping clues to get one of them in a department store. You see, these guardian angels, and the girls themselves, it turns out are magical. They had to be kept apart, a la Star Wars, a la Harry Potter, to protect them from the darkness, an especially horrible effect that you sadly have to look at throughout the majority of the film. But thankfully, there's a lot of imagination in other scenes. For example, despite the sisters being very similar, they both seem to have their opposite sides, like one enjoys being up during the day and the other enjoys being up during the night. One is a writer who writes about this magical world that it turns out is where they came from, and the other is an artist who thinks she's drawing self-portraits, but somehow she feels like it's not her. On top of that, their magic only seems to work when they're close to each other, hence why one has a necklace of the sun and the other has a necklace of the moon. Little touches like this I guess are obvious, but they're also a lot of fun. They show a connection in both relationship and ability, as well as make for some great visual storytelling. Things get even more complicated though when their mother finds out they're alive and obvious not bad guy is gonna help her find them. The funny thing is, for as obvious as some of this dialogue is, these actors really tried their damnedest to pull it off. Listen to this incredibly clumsy exposition done almost perfectly by these two actors who are really giving their hardest. Someone has been protecting them. You know they were killed in the battle that night with Aaron. My husband, your brother. Heroes, I have no doubt. But like the girls, their bodies never were found. Were they? That almost sounded natural. Even the villain. We look at him and we know he's the bad guy, but look at how charming he is and how smooth he is. You actually kind of really want to admire him for how diabolical he can be. But I know, it's a Disney Channel movie, we're not gonna get that deep. I mean, what, these two girls were separated from their parents, and even though they both have step-parents, and one even had a step-parent died, replaced with another step-parent, now she's gonna meet her actual mother? Come on, they're not gonna address any of this, actually they do! One of the twins' mother died three months ago, and this other mother has to take over, only to discover another mother is thrown into the mix, the real mother. A good chunk of the emotions you think would follow something like this actually are included. She doesn't want to meet the actual mother because she's lost so many mothers before. And even the stepmother she has now is feeling betrayed because she's almost dismissing her. And the acting from everyone impressively pulls it off. It's never too heavy that it feels like a soap opera, but it's not really ignored either. It does add a nice sense of drama and make the story feel a lot bigger than honestly it probably has any right to be. I mean, sure, it has the lame lines and roll your eyes moments, but there's not as many as you would think. In fact, a good chunk of the scenes that are supposed to get laughs do legitimately get laughs. I really love this one scene where the sister is saying she should be more aware of her surroundings, only to look right past her sister and see a sale at a mall. Look at the way that's shot, that's legitimately humorous. So, yeah, for an idea about sister sister being witches that battle evil, this is much better than it probably should be. It's nothing great, and there's dumb moments. But for the audience it's aimed at, there's just enough comedic timing, dramatic moments, and creativity to make it pretty good. If you just ignore the gimmicky scenes where they have to say stuff at the same time, you might actually find yourself having a fair amount of fun. High School Musical, the Disney Channel movie that started a friggin' phenomenon. There were two sequels, one of them getting a theatrical release, a hit soundtrack, and even a hit stage play that came from this. Kids growing up at the time were obsessed with this, and being adults, we of course rolled our eyes and said, oh come on. Stupid, lame, corny, blah 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 blah. 
If you've seen my review of High School Musical 3, which I did several Disney Simbers ago, you'll know that I think, yeah, it is all those things, but it's kind of smart about it, if that makes sense. It's kind of like our generation Saved by the Bell, except that it knows it's this generation Saved by the Bell. Does that mean where it all started is pure corny gold? Well, let's take a look. Troy and Gabrielle are two high school kids that meet at a New Year's party. They get forced into singing karaoke together and of course sound amazing, and sure enough, it turns out she's now going to his school. Oh, lucky lucky. They discover that they surprisingly like singing, but uh-oh, he's one of the best players on the basketball team and she's one of the smartest minds in the science club. So they're of course embarrassed when they think about trying out for the high school musical just because they want to. But a incredibly bizarre brother and sister team known as Sharpay and Ryan are always the center of attention in theater and thus they want to sabotage their chances of being stars. So they start telling everybody that they're trying out for the high school musical, but sure enough, everyone else starts to get the idea that maybe they should do what they really love. Maybe a skater can dance, maybe a basketball star can make cookies. Oh, the maddening possibilities. On the surface, this all seems, well, stupid. And yeah, it is stupid. It's a playful kind of stupid that makes it very obvious you're not supposed to take it that seriously. There's a whole song all the kids sing about sticking to the status quo. No high school kid would have that exact mindset, but it's kind of satirizing that mindset while also being silly about it. It's also nice to see what's mostly a hodgepodge of cliches break one or two cliches. For example, these stories are usually about the geeky kid trying to fit in, and I like the idea that these kids are already popular and they want to do something that's not very popular simply because they want to. As much as we like to make fun of characters like this, like, oh, being popular is so hard, I give it credit that does show their stress and pressure that applies to these kind of people too. That pressure of performing, that pressure of being what everybody wants you to be. I also like that the acting teacher is not your stereotypical inspiring acting teacher. She's actually kind of a bitch. She yells, she screams, she has really strict rules. It helps break the idea that this movie has an agenda to get you into musical theater. Ironically, there's not much musical theater in it. Oh, not that there are dance numbers and songs and such, but we don't even know what the high school musical is about. Hell, they don't even perform the high school musical. All we get up to is the audition part. And yeah, when you have characters like this brother and sister running around who are just so odd and so in their own little world, you kind of realize this movie's in its own little world too. The one thing that legitimately bothers me about it is that some of the characters cheat in order to get what they want. Well, okay, we learn our lesson, cheating is wrong, you should never force anything, but then the main characters cheat to make everything right! Well, wait a minute, anyone that knows anything about sports games or competition or anything knows that this is really wrong! This really isn't ethically sound. But when you get to the ending and see just how much everything wraps up, literally in one shot, it shows the epilogues of every character going super, super fast, you do realize, like the characters in the movie, you're not supposed to take this stuff that seriously. You're supposed to just have fun with it. So, does that mean I like it? Um, actually, I found it a little dull. Yeah, I know, right? It sounds like I'm praising the hell out of it, but honestly, it's kind of slow moving. I like that it deals with high school issues, granted in a very corny way, but I surprisingly could have used a few more energized musical numbers, because when they're just sitting around talking, it's not bad, but not good either. But to be fair, I'm sure that's because I'm an adult. Middle school kids, hell, even high school kids, I'm sure watched this and loved it and wanted to be the characters in this and spin around and look pretty and... I don't know, it's not my thing, but I can't say it's bad. The guy who directed these movies also directed Newsies, which I didn't like. I felt that flamboyant Broadway style didn't match the world that they were in. Here, the world definitely embraces it. And if that's your thing, I'm sure you'll have fun. It didn't really grab me, but it's not supposed to grab me. It's supposed to grab kids who want to sing and dance and look sparkly and fabulous. And maybe have a thing for your siblings, I don't know, am I the only one that got a little uncomfortable sometimes with that? I guess I can see why this took off. I mean, there is a lot of talent behind it. It's just not the kind of talent I get into. But for those that do, sit back. There's surprisingly a fair amount to appreciate. Okay, so if you saw my review of the first Cheetah Girls, you know that I think it's the worst of these Disney Channel films I've seen so far. 
So of course, I have to look at Cheetah Girls 2, and... Well, the good news is, it's not nearly as bad. Why? Well, let's just pick a random scene here. Yo, I've tried everything. She won't budge. There's a dance camp I can teach this summer, but it's basically babysitting. See what they're doing? They're talking! Yeah, they're not giggling or screaming or squeeing or jumping up and down or shouting Cheetah-licious or doing a dance number out of nowhere. They're actually shutting the hell up and listening to one another. That makes this film a million light years beyond the last one. Oh, thank heavenly Jesus. But with that said, does it actually make it good? Eh, uh, no. Actually, of all things, it makes it kind of boring. Now, don't get me wrong, I'd much rather take boring over whatever the hell the last one was, but it doesn't excuse the fact that it's still pretty dull. As you'd expect, the Cheetah Girls are a big hit, but it looks like one of them has to leave to go to Barcelona because her mother wants to be with her hopefully soon fiancé, who lives there. The Cheetah Girls find out, of course, there's a gigantic music contest there and decide, why the hell not? They'll go too. So they all travel to see the sights, or at least take some postcards, I'm assuming they didn't have a budget to see all the sights. And they come across cute boys, do some fun dance numbers, and even discover another girl entering the contest. At first it looks like her mother is on board with helping everybody out, but oh no! She actually wants to split the Cheetah Girls up! Why? Because one of the Cheetah Girls can sing in Spanish, and her and her daughter sound really good together, so she just wants it to be the two of them. Wait a minute, why doesn't she just join the group? Wouldn't that make a lot more sense? I just do whatever. So, despite her better judgment, the daughter tries to split the girls up, and at first it seems to work. Galleria gets so fed up that she's eventually gonna go home, but then they decide, no, we're all sisters, we're in it together, and they have the big reunion song number, and everything seems to be okay. All's well that ends well. Wait a minute, there's still 40 minutes left. What the hell are we gonna do with the rest of that time? Well, the mother tries to sabotage him again! Yeah, she sets them up at a club where they get paid, but that unfortunately means they're professionals and the head of the contest finds out and disqualifies them because it's only for amateurs. But it looks like the girl that speaks Spanish can still sing with the daughter, even though she's part of the group that was disqualified. She accepted money too, why wouldn't this... Ugh, whatever. So they're gonna sing together with the Cheetah Girl's blessings, but then... Wait a minute! The head of the contest figures out that the mother was the one who set up the paying gig, knowing it was a paying gig, so that somehow gets them back in? What? No, oh, who cares? Let's just end on the inevitable wedding between the other mother and the Barcelona guy, which focuses very little on them, and instead the Cheetah Girls singing over their moment. <laughs> yeah, really stealing the thunder from this plot thread. At first, they're bridesmaids in the background, and that kind of makes sense, but it keeps cutting back to them singing over a pretty landscape like the wedding is kind of secondary. No, no, screw the emotions of these two people. Our egos are too big that you have to focus on us. Or at least, that's how it comes across. That's how a lot of it comes across. Just an excuse for them to sing and look pretty and do dance moves, and sometimes it's okay. Like, I really like this one scene where they sing this Barcelona in lullaby, and it's in Spanish, and it's really quiet, and it's really nice. It's only two girls singing, and yeah, that was a nice change of pace and a legit nice moment. There's also a nicely done ballroom dancing scene where it's only two people dancing, there's not that many special effects or smoke or lights or distractions, it's just these two people dancing and they do it really well. And the fast editing and camera movements here, unlike the other times, don't get in the way or distract you, it actually emphasizes what a good job they're doing. Little scenes like that aren't bad, but for the most part, it's pretty forgettable. I think this is mainly so kids can just watch it and say, Oh, aren't I so much like Cheetah Girl number three? Oh, Cheetah Girl number four is just like my personality. What if I was there? And if that's something your kids like to do, more power to them. But for anyone else, it's not nearly as bad as the first, but it's a definite pass. Halloween Town High! Yeah, okay. They've made so many of these movies, I'm surprised there's not a Halloween Town Surf's Up, or How to Cook with Halloween Town. I mean, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? The first one I couldn't really get into aside from the makeup, and the second one I thought was legitimately enjoyable, even though they were bound to just a few locations. The third one falls somewhere in between. It pretty much just jumps right in there as we see our favorite family is toying with the idea of maybe having kids from Halloween Town go to school in the real world. In literally a flash, the eldest daughter, 
who's actually the only daughter now, the youngest one seems to have just disappeared. Uh, and it's no big loss. Is in front of the Halloween Town Council and is willing to put her idea to the test, except, well, her magic is on the line, as well as the magic of her entire family. Oops. So the kids from Halloween Town are in disguise as Canadians, yeah, foreign exchange there, that's really gonna be a culture shock, who are dressed up as humans and are trying to be shown that monsters and humans can get along. But unfortunately, this evil organization known as the Knights wants to keep these two groups separate because they still think humans are evil, not tolerant, and are just gonna be awful for them. And as we discover, they're willing to do anything to keep them apart. I'm not gonna lie, when I heard Halloween Town High, the first thing that came in my head is, oh cool, a school in Halloween Town. Seeing a bunch of ghouls and monsters learn all sorts of creative things, it's kind of a letdown knowing not only is it monsters going to the real world school, but it's monsters that aren't even allowed to be monsters. They have to be in disguise looking like real kids. That's not much fun. Because of this, we don't really get that much in terms of visuals and weird makeup and such. Every once in a while there's something cool, like marshmallow spiders, a bag that walks and eats people. And even the Halloween kids are allowed to take off their disguises once in a while. And is it me or did DreamWorks trolls totally rip this off? Thankfully though, the movie mostly makes up with this with some okay writing and some genuinely good performances. I mean, for a Disney Channel movie, I think we know we're not gonna get anything spectacular here. It's funny seeing these actors who were just so uncomfortable and awkward in the first film suddenly seem very natural and very interested in what they're saying, as any good actor should be. Any weird, strange stuff they have to say, they really try their hardest to make sound like this is just an everyday thing. And even the humans reacting to their odd ways get a few laughs. I especially love this boy's reaction when all the kids suddenly disappear into one car. Why does none of this surprise me? That seems so believable to me. <laughs> the message is made pretty clear as the villains, once they're revealed, are trying to make a whole group of people look bad based on the actions of only a few. And I'm not gonna lie, while I'm recording this and watching the news, this message does hold a lot more relevance now than it probably did back then. It's kind of like Zootopia, what I thought was a little too obvious and in your face, sadly it turns out is very, very needed nowadays. So I guess even its very simple message has a lot more relevance. The only thing that was starting to get on my nerves a little bit is the performance of the brother. I don't know, he's seeming a little too one note to me, just always complaining, always whining, making fun of everything. And don't get me wrong, this is very hard dialogue to make sound likable. It gets even stranger when he starts dating one of the kids from Halloween Town until he sees what she really looks like and suddenly he's disgusted. It's given a little bit of a spin when he discovers she thinks he's disgusting too. That's kind of an interesting point of view for kids, the gross monster sees us as gross monsters. But in the end, when it looks like they're gonna see past it, they still say that they find each other gross and they just decide to be friends. What a confusing message. So, yeah, were there a lot of possibilities that should have been taken advantage of? Yes. Are there a lot more creative elements that should have been here? Absolutely. But for what it is, it kept my interest. I wanted to know what was gonna happen. I wanted to know how they were gonna get out of the predicament. I enjoy the monster's point of view as well as the human's point of view, and when they did have those creative elements, they were a lot of fun. I guess if you're curious to see it just to say you've seen all the Halloween Town movies, it's not bad to check out. It's not gonna take anything to new levels or anything, but it's totally okay. Nothing wow-worthy, but passable enough. Possible, so the drama is very appropriately titled because there's actually not as much comedy in it as I would expect. The focus this time around is still a lot of action, but this time more about changing relationships. I personally prefer the comedy more, but this is still pretty good. After a big action sequence between Kim, Draken, and Shigo, come on, I gotta love anything that pays homage to Tim Burton's Batman. We discover that Kim, on top of saving the world, is going through some high school problems. The biggest one being who's she gonna take to the prom? In most movies, this would be a really lame subject to focus on, but this time around, it's about asking her best friend, Ron. Is it worth it? Are they ready to take the next step? Is that even the next step? While trying to figure out where their relationship is going, a new boy arrives to school, who seems identical to Ron, except he's good looking and, let's be honest, a little less annoying. Kim thinks maybe she doesn't have to sacrifice her friendship with Ron, but Ron is not too sure. 
for far too many strange things are happening. Like his favorite taco restaurant is being changed, designs for toys are being stolen by supervillains, and yeah, maybe he thinks his relationship with Kim should change too. It's looking more and more like this is all part of Draken's diabolical plan, which apparently even Shigo can't figure out, which is also part of his plan, because if she can't figure it out, Kim won't figure it out. Even though, let's be honest, the plan is pretty easy to figure out. But Kid Show, gotta give a little leeway. And speaking of leeway, you have to give quite a bit to this movie when you find out there's not as much comedy as there usually is with Kim Possible. But to be fair, what they sacrifice it for kind of makes sense. The first film really was not story-driven, it was just an excuse to have a bunch of jokes based on characters. This one slows it down, with only two villains this time, only one diabolical plan, as well as pacing an investment that's very much like, well, a movie. This time it feels like there's a little bit more weight to what's going on, it's kind of a bigger story, it takes its time, it lets the characters breathe. Some might find that as a turnoff, as they just want to see more jokes, but seeing how they thought this was going to be the last thing Kim Possible related, it actually was until they got renewed for another season, this somewhat serious tone is not a bad one to go out on. I give them credit that they actually want to make a movie this time, unlike the last one, which, while I enjoy it immensely, even I kind of acknowledge it was just kind of a long episode. I'm glad that this story, while predictable, is done in a way where I actually enjoy seeing these characters go through these dilemmas. Both Kim and Ron at times act a little selfish, but it's never to a point where we dislike them. It's understandable, that age is understandable, but it's never to a point where it feels cliched or forced. It's not the thing where one person is obviously in love with the other and one just doesn't see it and they go over the top and all that stupid stuff. They both kind of don't know whether or not they want to move forward, if this is a relationship that they should be lubby-dubby about or should just stay friends. You legitimately feel the relationship they've had for years and years. But heck with all that, how's the stuff you usually expect from Kim Possible? The gadgets, the action, the one-liners? For the most part, they step it up, but again, in a kind of different way, a way that feels more like a movie. This opening action sequence, for example, is done much slower than most of the other action sequences, but that's done so that it feels larger. These backgrounds are about as simple as they can be, but when you notice how they're positioned and how they shoot them and how every action that they have feels like they're actually going through it, it's very impressively done. Even the intro is obviously an homage to James Bond movies, but again, they kind of give it that Kim Possible feel. I really like these shows and movies that can take something that exists, pay homage to it, but still kind of make it its own thing. It's kind of like what Heath Ledger did with the Joker. It's kind of all the Jokers, but it's also his own thing at the same time. I appreciate something that can do that very smoothly. The jokes, when they have them, are good, there's just not as many as there usually are. We still get Dragon and Shigo bickering. We get Ron obsessing over something stupid and Kim with the last minute rescues and great one-liners. And I have to give credit that, at least in the movies, again, I haven't seen too much of the show, Ron is not just a sidekick. He legitimately helps out, and he helps out in ways that make sense to his character. They never feel forced. I've seen this kind of character so often turn into a pain in the ass, but he's legitimately helpful. Okay, at times he can be a little grating, but for the most part, I think it works. With the story, animation, action, and characters all taking on more of a cinematic tone, you get a Kim Possible movie that's different than what you'd expect, especially comparing it to the last one, but it's still reasonably well done. I think I'd probably rather watch the last one for more laughs, but for a final movie, this one gets it pretty good. Figure out the sitch and give it a watch. How many of these Halloween Town movies did they make? Okay, well, this is Halloween Town 4 Return to Halloween Town. Shouldn't the second one have been called Return to Halloween Town? I guess it doesn't matter. Kids that watch these movies obviously want to see the continuing adventures of Marty Piper, as well as her know it all brother and that third sister that still seems to have just vanished into thin air. This film involves Marty going to college. A college very similar to Hogwarts, almost rip offingly so. It looks like Hogwarts, the magic spells sound like Hogwarts, a lot of the students are looking more wizard and witchly. There's a few creative makeups, but for the most part, people are human looking. There's even a prophecy that says a magic student will come along to shift power and blah blah blah, you know this kind of story. 
It's uncovering a mystery while still trying to fit in. Trying to do the right thing even though there's peer pressure from the other side. There's evil students, evil teachers, but also good students and good teachers. And just when you think it's all gonna follow the predictable rule book, at the beginning of the third act there's time travel. Yeah, going back in time to see your magical ancestor that kinda comes out of nowhere. It's definitely all over the map, but I can't say it's offending by any means. The most interesting thing in watching these movies is comparing the acting. Watching the first film compared to the last film is really kind of eye-opening. I'm really wondering what was going on behind the scenes, or did they get different directors or whatever, because the performances given here, as well as in the last few films, was not the same as the first one. It's also kind of nice to see how much the family dynamic holds up. Okay, I can't act like the Pipers are the most interesting family, but at the same time, there's definitely a lot of scenes that show that they do care about each other. I like the mother checking in via washing machine. Yeah, it gets kind of weirdly fun. I like the cynical brother still trying to keep on top of things. I like the main character trying to blend in with new friends, but it's not all the cliches you think it necessarily would be. Like I said, I couldn't predict time traveling in this. But yeah, it's a little hard to shake the Harry Potter feel in all this, especially with the bad guys constantly talking about the ancient prophecy that will grant them the ultimate power, and they have to... God, what was it again? Turn the brother into a dog and hold him hostage so that she can get the magical device that grants all power and magic and give it to them. But wait, if she has all power and magic, couldn't she do whatever she wants with it? And yeah, that's kind of what ends up happening. I guess that's kind of a spoiler, but if you were in the situation, you'd do the same thing, so it's not really much of a surprise. There's one or two creative things that make it stand out a little bit, but it's not that much. The best way I can describe it is the mother, who yes, I know is April O'Neil, I'm sure a million of you were mentioning that, brings up before she goes to school that with great power comes great responsibility. The daughter straight up says, you stole that from Spider-Man. And that's kind of the feel of the entire film. You know they're ripping off a ton of other sources, but you know they're also having innocent fun with it. And yeah, like Harry Potter, the best parts of the movies are the parts that make it feel like a real school. Like they talk about this year as the first year they're letting in genies and mummies and yeah, witches. Tiny details like that add a credibility that make this world almost livable. Or at least you want to live in it. It's neat. But is it necessary or super exciting? Not really. But it's not really terribly written or harmful either. It's just another Halloween Town movie. That's the best way I can put it. If you can't get enough of this series and you want to see a fourth one, this will do you fine. For me, it has an unpleasantly status welcome, but I can say I'm definitely ready for Christmas. I finally finished up the High School Musical Trilogy with High School Musical 2. I know that's not the last one, but I actually saw the last one first, the first one second, and the second one last. Yep, that's entirely out of order. So I'll just jump right into it. When I pop this movie in, I'm not gonna lie, I was blown away. This opening is amazing. Probably the best thing I've seen out of all the movies. First off, it has a legitimately funny intro. The kids are all waiting for high school to end and summer to start, and the clock behind the teacher literally gets bigger every single time it cuts back to her. That's so clever it could be a John Hughes joke. Then the song singing about summer break starts, and I'm not gonna lie, it left me kind of speechless. They must have thrown everything into this one musical number. Look at the dancing, look at the movement, look at how they're utilizing everything around them. Look at the creativity in these steps. How many things can they do with a basketball and dancing? Damn, they find just about everything you can do with it. Look at the editing, look at the camera work, look at what a grand scale this is. And on top of that, parts of the film have legitimately good jokes. Yeah, not jokes like, oh, it's for kids, I guess I'll laugh. No, legitimately funny jokes. I love these yuppie parents that use their kids as balance. The scene demonstrating how bad kid golfers can be is downright hilarious. Good job, killer. Make the ball fear you. I actually rewound the film to hear that line again and made me laugh so hard. It's also the only high school musical to show the bloopers, and they're pretty funny too. So yeah, an unbelievable opening followed by some real good laughs and an all around, eh, movie. Yeah, if you thought this was the one that was finally gonna win me all the way over, you're tapping to a different tune. While it does have some of the best parts of any of the movies, it's still on par with, say, that season of Saved by the Bell where they all got jobs at a resort over summer vacation. You remember that? Of course you don't. If you're watching this, you're not in your 30s. 
Summer begins and everybody just so happens to get a job at, of course, a fashionable resort owned by Sharpay's parents. Sharpay decides for the resort's talent show she wants Zac Efron as her co-host. This, of course, angers her incestuous brother. Okay, I'm not the only one who sees this, right? Tell me somebody else sees this! Of course he, his girlfriend Gabriella, and all his friends want to be in the talent show too. But Sharpay thinks there's too many people and tries to, of course, sabotage him into only working with her. Yeah, okay, pretty lame, but it is made a little bit more interesting when her parents seem to be opening a lot of doors for scholarships and good schools. This makes him more susceptible to Sharpay and even easier letting his friends go. While doing the talent show in the grand scheme of things is not a big deal, they do make kind of a bigger deal that he is sort of manipulating himself and changing himself to open doors and he doesn't know how much to hold on to and how much to give up. This is kind of an interesting subject to talk about, and sometimes they do treat it very seriously, but the problem is, it's dealt with a lot better in the third one. When all the kids are graduating, they're trying to figure out what to do, where to go, what colleges they're gonna be at, splitting up, discovering who they want to be, and yeah, it's just done better, more realistic, more thought-provoking, and this is just the typical, you're letting that girl brainwash you, man, who are you? I don't know who you are anymore. Granted, it's done a little bit more delicately and they don't entirely make Sharpay the villain, but the version I saw is almost two hours, and it feels like it. When they try telling jokes and doing visual humor, it works. But a lot of the drama and, yeah, even a lot of the song numbers aren't exactly that strong. I feel like they open with too strong of a punch. That first musical number was such a big deal that nothing in the rest of the movie could possibly top it. So a lot of it just kind of meanders. A good half of it is them just moping around the resort and skipping in kitchens. Okay, rewind that, we gotta see that again. Can somebody explain what this is? And while nothing in it is certainly bad, it doesn't really all gel together either. I remember kind of looking at my watch saying, man, how long is this movie? Can we get to the funny stuff again? Or can you throw one of them a basketball? I don't know, just do something like what you were doing before. But yeah, when it gets to those enjoyably corny scenes, they are enjoyably corny. The last minute duet that pops up at the end had me laughing so hard when it's revealed who he's gonna do the duet with that I had to pause it, I was laughing so much. You just shrug and lovingly say only the Disney Channel would give us something so schmaltzy. And like I said, that stuff surprisingly doesn't bother me, that's part of the fun. For me, it's just when it's slow, serious, and been done a million times, adding nothing really new. It by no means does it throughout the entire film, but it does it through a lot that you do kind of move around in your seat a bit. There's not even a high school musical in it. The first one, we don't get to see the high school musical, and this one, they just write it out of the entire movie. Talk about false advertising. Does it need to exist? No. Does it really further the characters that much? Not really. But again, there are some very impressive, very creative, and even very funny scenes. I guess if you like the first one, you'll like this one enough. I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see some parts again. Either to laugh or just admire how well choreographed it is. Kind of a mixed bag, but that's High School Musical in a nutshell to me. Get your dance shoes on and check it out for yourself. It's Twitches 2, spelled with two O's, because... clever? If you saw my review of the first film, you know that I thought it was actually kind of well done. Eh, for what it is. It was a good family fantasy that had some good laughs, some legitimately good drama, and some magical elements. The sequel is... pretty much the same. And not in a bad way like everything is on repeat, they do throw in a lot of new stuff. Heck, they actually take out a lot of the annoying things from the first one. Like, they very rarely say, Go Twitches! or do any catchphrases. In fact, I can only think of two at the end, where they do that stupid little dance and then they both go, Loser! Oh, that's painful. The rest of the film is once again kinda cheesy, but kind of interesting too. Our Twitches, played again by the Maori sisters, find that being friends is one thing, but being sisters living together is something different. They're snipping at each other more, having disagreements, and not always getting along. But at the end of the day, they're still sisters and they still connect. But that comes to a bit of a head when their mother, the real mother, reveals that another evil force is slowly slipping into their kingdom and they need their magic to stop it, particularly during an eclipse. It seems that someone or something in the shadow world is starting to infiltrate their real world. Their magic can get rid of it for good, but there's one problem. 
While most of the people think it's Thanos, the villain from the first film, one of the sisters thinks it's her father. And because we don't see things from the point of view of the shadowy monster, it very well could be. This creates a rift between the sisters as well as the rest of the family, including their bickering protectors who have now decided to get married. All throughout the film, magical clues, backstory, shadows sneaking around, all indicate that something is up, but we don't quite know what. Is it the villain? Is it the father? Even if it is the father, look at this portrait of him. Maybe he's a bad guy too. After all, they were related. The pacing and atmosphere in this movie is still reasonably well done. So many times you'll just see a shadow sneaking in the background and you have no idea is this for good or for evil. And this creates a nice family dynamic among our heroes. In fact, there's even more than that. They find out that not everybody can use magic. In fact, it's practically outlawed. While the mother sees this as a necessity, one of the sisters doesn't. And both sides have very legitimate points. It's not something like Little Mermaid 3 where all music is outlawed and that's obviously bad. Here, it actually kind of makes sense the choices that people make and the arguments they have for their side. Again, I feel like that's strangely the strength of these movies is that there actually is kind of a family connection. Disagreements don't always mean one is obviously right and one is obviously wrong. But on top of that, there's a ton of other things that Disney Channel viewers would like. You get to see him go on dates, you find out one might be a prince, but that turns out he's just wearing a butler's outfit because he works in the kitchen. There's a boyfriend who used to date one of the sisters and now he's dating the other one, but the shadow suddenly possesses him. Maybe it seems to be following him. There's all sorts of nice little touches going on. The effects are still pretty bad, but they're at least a little better than the last one. They at least try to go more cinematic with them. Sometimes they work, other times they're pretty awkward. But thankfully a lot of it is shot more cinematically, so you're more looking at the nice sets and cinematography than you are how bad the effects are. Eh, yeah, for the most part. Again, they can be really awkward. <laughs> it's funny because I just had to watch Return to Halloween Town where a lot of it obviously steals from Harry Potter. Here, this one steals from Harry Potter too, but it also kind of steals from Lord of the Rings with shadowy figures and even a ring and a dark presence trying to take human form and... Yeah, on the one hand, I could shout rip off. It does seem to come back to its own thing just enough. And the elements it does borrow from Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings seem to be good elements that they're borrowing from. Like there's a backstory about how the mother and father met. The father wanted to get the mother a gift and so she asked for a star. And that's exactly what he got her. A star that can fit in her pocket. And that seems Harry Potter-esque, but it's just different enough to let it pass. That dark presence you always feel watching you and always seems to be around very much feels like Sauron from Lord of the Rings. But again, they add that you don't know if it's evil and you don't know what it can do. It's almost like it's similar ideas, but the changes they make are just enough to make it so it's not really distracting and you're still invested in the story. Add some good one-liners and even some good dramatic moments, and yeah, you have a sequel about as good as the first one. It still has hammered in moments and schmaltzy moments, but again, I think that's kind of expected for a Disney Channel movie. When it wants to get a small laugh out of you, it works. And when it wants to get a little emotion out of you, it works then too. I'm actually kind of surprised I liked these movies as much as I did. I doubt I'll play it again, but I was glad I sat down and watched them once. It felt like there was a lot more to it than just sister sister if they were witches. It has its own universe, it has its own identity, and it has more than enough to keep kids entertained. I know it's weird, but as these Disney Channel movies go, these films are surprisingly pretty decent. Oh my god, guys, Camp Rock is so bad. I know I kind of sound like a giggling idiot saying that, but I'm sorry, it's really hard not to laugh when talking about this movie. It is just so bad. Okay, it's not as surreal as Can of Worms or as annoying as Cheetah Girls, but it really is kind of amazing how they hit every single possible cliche you could do with this story. Where do I even begin? I'll start at the beginning, cause yeah, it's like everything immediately seems awkward and out of place even from the start. There's this high school girl named Mitchie who's really excited to go to Camp Rock, but it looks like her parents aren't able to have her go. But then it turns out, they can! Yeah, th that's the opening, what was the point of that? 
She finds out she can't go. She mopes for maybe a minute, and then the parents are so excited they tell her that they can go because they're catering there, and she's excited again. Why wasn't that edited out? I'll tell you exactly why. Because they saw in other movies this cliche where somebody is sad they can't go to a place but then happy when they find out they can. Even though they don't really grasp that that goes through a long time and there's ups and downs, peaks and valleys and arches and stuff like that. No, you just need a minute of this not yet developed character sulking and then suddenly being happy. And that's pretty much how the rest of the film works, just trying to cram in as many cliches as possible. They can't even juggle them all. You see, the Jonas Brothers, oh wait, I'm sorry, not the Jonas Brothers, a completely different band, has a lead singer who's acting out and totally forgetting what it means to be about the music. So his band members drop him off at Camp Rock to hope he will regain his voice. Yeah, because a teeny bopper pop singer surrounded by teens is gonna help him discover his voice. Isn't that what he already gets? Even the first scene we have with him and Mitchie at the camp is just a mix of too many cliches. He's running away from a bunch of girls, so he hides in a bush. She suddenly gets an urge to play in the piano. You know, be herself and play her little solo that she wrote. I think the idea is that he's supposed to hear her music and be inspired, but they don't show anything like that. She's playing and it keeps cutting back to him, but he's not looking up at her or acting like he's hearing anything. He's just looking at these girls he's trying to hide from. Then she disappears, then he goes inside, and it's like, was anybody here? Oh, okay, so you did hear what was in there. How come nothing on your face indicated that? How come none of the editing indicated that? Well, pff, no time to answer that. We have to get to all our incredibly cliched characters. Like the popular bully, who apparently runs the camp. Well, how does a teen pop singer run a camp? Even the snarky best friend stereotype is like, yeah, music doesn't fly here, it's all about the bling. That's why she runs the camp. But it's okay because Mitchy, of course, makes up a lie that her parents are incredibly popular and presidents of companies and stuff like that. And she's totally been in a lot of music videos and, uh-oh, will that lie be revealed somewhere down the road? Well, again, we have no time for that cliche because we had to get to the cliche of the Jonas brother just sitting alone, saying he doesn't like being a label and he wants to work in his own music and not this cookie cutter stuff. Uh, newsflash jackass, the guy sitting alone on the beach playing his guitar is also a label. You're living proof of that being a Jonas Brother acting out this cliché. But up, we have to get to the cliché of the bully girl throwing food at another girl, but it's okay because she'll still sabotage her by interrupting her performance saying that she saw a snake. So, okay, so it got interrupted, the girl can go right back to playing. Oh, no, she's too mad, uh, apparently she can't keep playing. What reality is this in? And where the hell are the counselors? There's no order at this place! But apparently that's still not enough cliché, so the bully girl makes it look like she stole something from her. Oh my god, this is overload! Did anybody have an original thought when making this? But it's tragic too, because that bully girl, it turns out her mother is a pop star and doesn't have time for her. Ooh, this film's deep, guys! So now Mitchie's a liar and apparently a thief, but of course, it'll take some sort of big jam concert at the end to make everybody okay. Mitchie, her best friend, Jonas brother number three, even the bully girl ends up being a best friend at the end. Okay, you know what? I am sick of this. There needs to be some consequences. I'm usually for forgive and forgetting everything, but this is ridiculous. What number Disney Channel movie is this where they just kiss and make up at the end? Totally forget all the terrible things they've done and they just allow them to be friends again. I know it's good to be nice, but I'm sorry, there's gotta be some goddamn responsibility in this world! Oh, and by the way, in answer to the first question you were probably asking when you saw this review, the answer is no. The Jonas Brothers cannot act. We have a problem with that. Actually, I don't really have a problem with that. We have a problem with that. One word. Payback. That's two words. By God, is that painful. This film doesn't have a corny charm like the high school musicals or the Twitches films. It's just manipulative, beginning to end. Nothing seems real, nothing seems interesting. Which is a shame because I think the girl playing the main lead actually isn't that bad. She has kind of this awkward smile and okay delivery that I could totally see working in another film. But here, there's nothing she or any of these cast members can do. It's just every cliche checklist you can imagine. And I'll be honest, it's hard to say I didn't kind of enjoy how bad it was. I mean, good lord, even the songs suck. For Jonas Brother number three talking about cookie cutter pop songs, there sure are a lot of cookie cutter pop songs in this. 
So yeah, I can kind of see people looking back on this and laughing the same way we look back on Space Jam and laugh. Like, it's just so incredibly dumb and dated. But if you're looking for a legitimately good or charming movie, I could easily say get the rock out of here. <laughs> Wizards of Waverly Place the movie, yet another Disney Channel movie based on a Disney Channel show that I have never watched. Honestly, I didn't even know this is where Selena Gomez came from. Once again, seeing how I haven't seen the show, I can't really compare it to the original source material, but I can say for a newcomer, I actually followed it surprisingly well. And also as a newcomer, I actually didn't see it as that bad. My first initial thought was it was going to be another Harry Potter spinoff like some of these other Disney Channel movies, but that's not really quite the direction it goes. Alex, played by Selena Gomez, is part of a family of wizards that lives on Waverly Place, but they don't stay there long as the mother decides they need to grow closer together. So the family takes a vacation, but the teens, being normal teens, are not having a lot of fun. Alex eventually feels so shut in that she accidentally uses her powers to make it seem like her mom and dad never met. The spell works, the parents have no idea who each other are or the kids, and they seem like completely different people when they're single. Using their magic irresponsibly, not caring that much about other people, all the usual stuff. But it looks like they only have 48 hours before reality sets in and the kids themselves will disappear. In fact, their memories already seem to be going. But it just so happens they come across a half-assed magician who used to be a wizard, in fact the parrot used to be his girlfriend, who has a secret map to the Stone of Dreams, a magical device you can make one wish upon that'll come true. So it's Harry Potter slash Even Stevens slash Indiana Jones slash Beach Vacation that all these Disney Channel movies seem to like to go on. Upon hearing the plot, you wouldn't think very much of the movie, and truth be told, its strength is not in its writing. Its strength is in its performances. In a lot of these Disney Channel movies, you always kind of feel like these actors are shoved together really fast, and yet they're supposed to act like a family, like they've known each other for years, and you can't blame them. I doubt they have much rehearsal and they have to just go. But here, because I think they did have years of being on a show, they really have a camaraderie. All right, people, let's move this way. The other way. The other this way. They have the one-liners, they have the zingers, but they never seem too mean. They seem like the kind a normal family would make. Take for example this scene where the father asks for the wand back. Just give me the wand. Come on. Come on. Give me the wand. Give me the wand. Now written down, him mimicking him wouldn't be that funny, but because the performances seem very real, it works. That really is the saving grace of this movie. I legitimately like watching these people. Nobody seemed out of place, no one was giving an awkward acting job, they all seem legitimately believable. Even something as silly as this magician talking to his parrot. It's so dumb, but by god, every minute he's on screen, I believe that parrot is his girlfriend. He sells it as well as Jimmy Stewart does, making you believe there's a rabbit in the room. Yeah, yeah, but I, I know, I know you were sentenced to 50 years in feathers. <laughs> but if you take the stone first, they'll disappear forever. <laughs> You're kind of good at this, aren't you? They not only work in context of the comedy, but they work in connection to the other characters. I totally buy every single one of their relationships, and they would act how they're acting towards one another. The only part where I get a little lost, and again, maybe this comes back to having to know the show, is that there's this competition at the end that they have to go through in order to become real wizards, but it kind of springs out of nowhere in that they talk about it a little bit, but you don't think it's going to be the climax. They both have to try in order to become real wizards so that they can get the spells to put everything right, and yeah, it's pretty, it's neat, it's creative, but I just don't think it was fully explained or worked into the story that great. Especially when you find out what saves the day, it almost kind of seems pointless. But still, most of the funny moments work, it looks nice, it's creative, and even some of the dramatic moments hit bullseyes. And again, that comes from the surprising believability of these performances. Does every joke work? No. Does every line work? No. Are there awkward moments? What Disney Channel movie doesn't have that? But still, at the end of the day, I like watching this family. They're snarky, but you can tell they love each other, and it doesn't feel manipulative. It's the same way Malcolm and the Mill act so mean to each other, but at the end of the day, you know they're a unique unit and they still function as a caring family. That's more than enough for me to say this ain't half bad. Man, 
just when you think things can't get any worse, Camp Rock Goddamn 2. If you saw my first review of Camp Rock, you know I thought it was a real piece of shit, but it was kind of so bad, it's good, and... Uh, it was just a piece of shit, but you know what? It made me laugh how bad it was. This one is definitely on the same level, if not more, but what little shred of naivete the first film had is totally erased here. And it's parading around like it has the most soul and humanity, and it has none of that. Absolutely none of that. You feel every manipulative, bullshit, cookie-cutter moment for what it is. It put me in a bad mood, and I'm here to bitch about it. Okay, so once again, Mitchy is returning to Camp Rock. She's surprised to find out, though, that Camp Rock is now a musical. Yeah, not like they sit around and sing songs or perform on stage like in the first one. No, literally, everybody has a dance number ready. If someone just says, hey, I want to sing about something, suddenly the whole camp joins in and they're all synchronized and it's like High School Musical. What? The first film wasn't like that, so why is this suddenly like that? It's like if suddenly in the Spider-Man movies it turns into a musical. Well, okay, that did kind of happen, but people hated that too. But the guy who runs the camp is kind of bummed out because it just so happens another rock camp opened right across from them. Camp Star, run by his ex-band member that he threw out because he just didn't make it about the music, man. And now he's vowing to destroy Camp Rock at all costs. How do I know this? Because he literally announces it to the entire camp. Camp Star, founded not so coincidentally by my out-to-destroy-me former bandmate, Axel Turner. Who does that? Who's freaking awkward enough to tell their entire camp this? But to literally sweeten the deal, they parachute s'mores on the crowd, leading to probably my favorite line. Graham crackers! Why does that make me laugh so much? It's just so clueless and lifeless. Graham crackers! That's everybody's bland performance in one uninterested line. Graham crackers! Camp Star invites Camp Rock over to a bonfire, which I swear to God is run by the brother of the guy who ran Cobra Kai, and randomly asks someone if they want to perform. Mitchy says yes, does one of many bland songs, and big shock, they show them up with all these expensive dance numbers and hey, offers the Camp Rock counselors on the spot to join their team, to which of course, they all go over. If there are any Camp Rock counselors or staff, who'd like to make the switch, I'd be more than willing to double your salary. Yeah, it's this kind of movie, guys. Even the blonde girl who's the villain in the first one that they became friends with at the end, she goes over there! Christ, didn't I call it? When there's no repercussions, this shit just repeats itself. This means, oh no, Camp Rock has to be canceled because they have no counselors. But of course, Mitchie, her friends, and naturally the Jonas Brothers all come together to be counselors. But, uh-oh, being a counselor is hard as they all contribute their one personality trait of being clumsy. Yeah, nobody else has any other personality traits, it's just clumsiness. Ooh, I relate to them now. But when Camp Rock goes over to challenge Camp Star, Master Cobra Kai says, why don't we televise the whole thing? I what? Just like that, he has connections to broadcast this to millions of people. They of course agree, which pisses off the guy who owns Camp Rock because he's like, oh no, Camp Rock will close forever. Oh, what are you talking about? Millions of people are gonna see you. Even if you lose, the phone will ring off the hook. You'll get all this free attention. But nope, he thinks this is gonna be the end, which forces Mitchie to work even harder, but oh no, is she losing the soul of the music? Is she losing the fun of camp? Camp Star has the money and moves, but do they have the love? Do they have the genuine human spirit? No, and neither do you, you corporate piece of shit. I'm sorry, this really pisses me off when Disney and the Jonas Brothers are saying you gotta be more authentic, you gotta be more real, and they just go into this bullshit song sequence with all the auto-tuning and nothing about it feels authentic, it feels manipulative and bullshitty. Is that even a word? I don't care, I'm making it a word. It's bullshitty. Even Mitchie. In the first film, I said I could see her actually kind of being a good actress. She had kind of this awkward smile that looked a little geeky, but it was still kind of charming. Here, that smile never goes away. If anything, they like perfected it, and it's on her face 24-7. I just want to rip that little smile off, I see it so much. She seems like a robot. They all seem like robots. None of them seem like actual people. But we should listen, because this is the authentic side that has the heart and soul. Oh, shut the hell up. If anything, I actually side with Camp Star. They say they're there to make people stars, and they say it has a lot of sacrifice and giving things up, and they're right! 
Anyone that knows anything about the entertainment industry will tell you this. If Camp Rock just wants to be a little fun camp where you play some songs and sit around a fire, that's fine, but why the hell do you have celebrities there? The Jonas Brothers are at your camp. As soon as you do that, it's not gonna be about just sitting around singing songs and having fun. And maybe it would come across better if the people seem like real people, but not one iota of them ever does. The only actress who sometimes seems genuine is the daughter of Cobra Kai. Yeah, they do a stupid Romeo and Juliet thing with star-crossed lovers on each camp, and to her credit, when she talks, she sounds like an actual human being. You don't see metaphorical charts and graphs all around her saying, hey, this'll hit a certain demographic, or you gotta have this funny thing happen because numbers indicate this is where this stuff happens. She sells it like an actual person. Everyone else sounds bland, forced, and forgettable. Even the songs, this is a musical and like 90% of them are entirely pointless. You could have cut them and not miss a thing. I don't know why this movie pissed me off more than the last one. I mean, the last one was really bad too, but something about this one just saying that it understands like real art, real poetry, the real human condition, and it so clearly doesn't. I feel like naive kids are gonna look at this and say, I understand what it means to be an artist. I understand being a musician. I understand the sacrifice and being real. No, you don't. And neither does this movie. It doesn't even get a hint of it. Both art and entertainment should be taken seriously. And if you're saying you're a movie that understands both, and this is your understanding of it, then you're clearly showing your corporate strings being pulled. Ah, said enough. This movie sucks. Bye. Graham crackers. It's the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody the Movie! Yet again, another movie based on a show I didn't watch. And if this movie is any indication of what the show is like, I think it's pretty obvious why I didn't watch it. The Sweet Life starts off ironically having nothing to do with sweets, in fact it's actually on a ship. I'll just assume something happened in the show to make that happen. Actually, it's a little weird seeing how Zack and Cody aren't technically in the title of this movie, only The Sweet Life is, and yet there's no sweet in it. So honestly, this entire movie is a complete lie. Regardless, Zack and Cody are identical twins, but one of them has a problem. He won an internship to get into Yale, which means he can't hang out with his girlfriend for a bit. She gets pissed off splitting up with him, and to make things worse, his smart aleck brother messes up his internship, getting him thrown out. But it looks like the scientist he was working with has another internship for him. One that involves, no surprise, twins. So they're both sent to this lab that experiments on twins to see if they can create a certain fruit, where the more you eat it, the more you can feel each other's pain, grow empathy, and eventually become one mind. But wait, isn't that a bad thing? Well, yes it is, when we discover that the scientist actually has evil plans to turn all twins into one hive, and force them to take over... I don't know, the world? It's kind of a weird plan for kind of a weird movie. So the biggest problem with this film is very obvious. It's not funny. But I don't think it's supposed to be funny to me. This is funny to the same crowd that liked, say, Good Burger. Like, little, little kids. One of the earliest jokes they have is mishearing mammal for camel. Actually, none of them are not fish, they're mammals. But they don't have humps. And if you didn't laugh at that, I'm sorry, that's what they think is the best joke. In fact, they do it four times in the film. They're not fishies, they're mammals. Then why don't they have humps? The movie is mostly filled with humor like this and actors that aren't bad, but aren't good either. It's slow, clunky, awkward, but again, I think it's that way because it's mainly aiming for little, little children to be watching it. And yeah, you might be arguing, don't our little kids deserve better? And yeah, sure, but at the same time, there's nothing really harmful in this. I'm not watching this thinking it's like Camp Rock 2, where there's actually a bad message or bad ideas being thrown by. It even once in a while gets a little bit of a giggle. Like the delivery from the mad scientist is legitimately well-timed. And once in a while, the girlfriend's delivery can get a few laughs. Everything else is just kind of what you think would be done with this concept, just kind of slow and not funny. But I'd be lying if I said I couldn't see an audience of little kids watching this and having a fun time. Is there anything in it for adults? No. Is there anything really that great for kids in it? No. If nobody sees it, is anyone going to miss out on anything? Probably not. But nothing is going to be made worse by seeing it either. It's like a sock puppet show. There's nothing really to it, but what's there really to get angry at either? It's hitting the right crowd and not making anything worse. 
I know that's definitely not a glowing recommendation, but what can I say, this movie didn't leave that big an impact on me. If you like it, you're probably the exact right age group for it, and if you don't, you're probably the exact wrong age group for it. I guess I could be angry and say kids deserve a lot more, but honestly, it's just not worth the effort. It's Zack and Cody. It's stupid, but it's painless. Take it for what it's worth and just be happy it's not Cheetah Girls. And if you think that's the best thing I can say about it, you're right. Later. Introduced to a lot of interesting kid shows over the years, Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, Steven Universe, but somehow Phineas and Ferb has missed my eye. I do see people dress up like them at cons and even some kids wearing t-shirts and stuff, but I really don't have any idea what the show is about. Just that people think it's good and it's getting a bit of a following. Well, after seeing Phineas and Ferb across the second dimension, I can definitely see why. This is definitely a strange but highly entertaining idea. The plot of the show, if I read the movie correctly, is that two boys named Phineas and Ferb go on wild adventures with their pet Perry, a platypus, and yet somehow have no idea that they're going on these wild adventures because Perry keeps his secret identity of a secret agent a secret. Their sister Candace always tries to get him in trouble, but the mother never sees what they're up to. Well, this time, things are a little different, as Dr. Doof, Perry's arch nemesis, creates a device that can go into parallel dimensions where he's actually incredibly powerful and has taken over the world. Of course, when that successful Dr. Do finds out about the device, he wants to use it to take over even more dimensions, starting with the one Phineas and Ferb are from. But in order to save them, Perry has to reveal his secret identity. This creates a riff in their friendship, and they don't know if they can ever trust one another again. And things get even crazier when they meet themselves in the parallel dimension, find they're usually the opposite, and try to utilize their strengths and their weaknesses to work together and stop the evil takeover. The best way I can describe this movie is think Kim Possible meets Rick and Morty for kids. But still a funny Rick and Morty. The humor is very fast, very strange, and very visual. Even though not all the jokes get a hard laugh, they keep throwing them at you so quickly that you forget the ones you didn't laugh at or are just having so much fun with the ones you are. Even though I've never seen an episode of the show, I can quickly figure out what the running jokes are. Perry never talks, Fur usually doesn't talk, Phineas is optimistically naive, and the parents never figure out what's going on with the sister getting more and more angry. With that said, I do feel there's a couple things I would probably enjoy more if I watched the show. For example, in the last third, all these other animal critters show up, and I don't really know who they are, but I'm sure they were in the shows. There's also all these strange robots and inventions that come out of nowhere, and they look so well designed, they must have been from the series. I'm assuming every one of these creations probably had their own episodes, and they're all coming together here. Which, for a fan, would be a really, really big deal. Heck, Perry revealing his true identity is a big deal. But for someone who hasn't seen the show, it's still pretty entertaining. They're nice, if not simple characters, living in a very bizarre and surreal world. At first I was kind of thrown off by the animation. I don't know, some about the designs are really weird. Are they supposed to be shaped like the first letter of their names? But in the last third, the action scenes are amazing. Look at how quick they are, look at how smooth it is. It's just one crazy energized thing after another crazy energized thing. And it never lets up, it just keeps going and going and going, and it's a ton of fun. So yeah, I feel like I would like this movie a lot more if I did watch the show, but at the same time, it does encourage me to go and watch the show. It seems really cute, creative, and funny all at the same time. Definitely something I wouldn't mind checking out. So whether you're a fan of the show or a complete newcomer, slap on your fedora for secret agent craziness. Talk about the Descendants. Ever since this idea was greenlit, everyone's been sending me links and updates about what an awful idea this is. A Disney Channel movie about famous animated Disney villains who have rowdy teenage kids that go to school. Everyone's been going on and on about just how stupid this is. And yeah, it's pretty bad. Is it the worst of these Disney Channel movies I've seen? No. Are there definitely times where there's a lot of effort put in? Absolutely. But <laughs> it's still pretty bad. I mean, 
what can you even do? It just comes from an awful idea. In a faraway land, Belle and the Beast rule all the fairy tale kingdoms, I guess, and they merge them all together, but put all the Disney villains on this island that's actually a little bigger than the good kingdom. That's confusing. Keeping them separate. But Belle and the Beast's son, who's gonna be king soon, has a brave new idea that the offspring of these villains should be allowed to go to their school. Treated like any other decent human being. These kids include the son of Cruella de Vil, the son of Jafar, the daughter of the Evil Queen, and the daughter of Maleficent. And if you're excited to see the live-action version of your favorite Disney villains, <laughs> you shouldn't be. These are treated like the Adam West Batman villains if the last shroud of dignity was waterboarded out of them. They're barely even recognizable outside of their clothes. In fact, if you had them in completely different clothes, you probably wouldn't even be able to tell which villains they were. Man, just when I thought they couldn't do Maleficent worse than Angelina Jolie, we get this interpretation. The Mistress of All Evil, one of the greatest Disney villains ever, is now a snorting, high-pitched, squealing, bad joke-cracking twit. And the others are not much better. But nevertheless, they see an opportunity when their kids are invited to go to school among the good people. And they convince them to steal the ultimate weapon of power, the magic wand, from the fairy godmother who runs the school. But wouldn't you know it, the longer they stay there, the more they realize they might like being good. Oh, so much conflict. And maybe that's the biggest surprise about Descendants, is that there is legit conflict. The kids all do a good job portraying what they're supposed to portray. Honestly, every actor does. I doubt they told Kathy Najimi to play the evil queen as this dignified evil villain. No, it's Kathy Najimi. You got her to be funny. She, as well as all the other actors, are giving exactly what's being asked for. It just so happens what's being asked for is incredibly stupid. Half the time, they really try to make the Disney characters look like the Disney characters. You know that's Maleficent, you know that's the evil queen, they have the stained glass window from Beauty and the Beast. Even the title, Descendants, has the Disney D in it. But it so obviously doesn't go with what they're trying to do here. There's scenes of the kids trying sweets for the first time because they never had chocolate or good fruit or anything like that. They start getting teary-eyed when they hear how other parents treat their kids and compare it to their parents. There's a downright uncomfortable moment when the mother of Sleeping Beauty totally disregards the daughter of Maleficent because she couldn't see her daughter for 16 years. And it's treated with all seriousness. I, okay, so we're gonna take this really seriously? Maybe you should cut scenes like this. It will help you find things. Like a prince. Like my waistline. Like the magic wand, hello? hello. These things clearly don't go together, and I have no idea how this was supposed to work. The only possible way I could see this maybe working is if you never actually see the villains. Like you see the kids, but the villains are always kept in shadow, and they're legitimately intimidating and scary, and like your imagination can fill in how threatening they are. But no, they have song and dance numbers right off of a cheesy Broadway show. This is so clearly not the Maleficent from the original movie, but it's not this other Maleficent you're trying to create either that's like really intimidating and destroyed a lot of lives and everything either. She's a joke, she's a punchline, but the movie doesn't always treat it that way. The song and dance numbers are similar. At first, they're actually kind of impressive. This is the guy who did the High School Musical film, so yeah, it's choreographed really nice, the songs at first are kind of catchy, heck, even the emotional ones are done relatively well. Much better than Camp Rock or Cheetah Girls, anyway. I feel legitimate emotion here. But then, you immediately take that point away when you hear their R&B version of Be Our Guest. Tie your napkin round your neck, Cherie, and we'll provide the rest. That's right. <laughs> oh my god, stop. Stop, stop. Like I said, it's kind of hard to blame the director or the actors because it very much feels like they're just following orders and they're doing it as best they can. But the order is a tone-confused mess, and just not a good idea. Like, at all. They talk about prejudice and the sins of the parents that shouldn't be passed down to the kids, and yeah, that's something for older kids to get into. It's very relevant. But the idea is clearly meant for kindergartners. And half the time, that's how it's portrayed. Except when it's trying to be portrayed as this really dramatic musical. Ah, uh, yeah, so it is really stupid, but I will give credit, it's not as stupid as it could have been. Well, okay, very large chunks are. But there's also a lot of very talented songwriters, choreographers, singers, dancers, actors. It's the right people for the wrong project. It's hard to know who the audience is supposed to be, but seeing how they made a sequel, I guess it did find an audience, and eh, if they like it, good for them. Like I said, there's really nothing wrong in it. 
It's just so stupid. If this is the kind of corny insanity that does it for you, I'd be lying if I said I didn't almost understand. It is fascinating in its choices. But if you're looking for a movie where all this talent comes together in a coherent story, then you ain't gonna live happily ever after here. finish up Disney Semper with Descendants 2. Well, if you saw my first review, you know I'm not exactly a big fan of this big surprise, but sometimes it could be enjoyed in a so bad it's good kind of way. This one is bad in a very different way. A strange way. And that's saying a lot seeing how this is already a strange movie series. Is it better? Worse? Well, it's kind of hard to say. On the surface, the plot seems exactly what you think it would be. The descendants are still living among the do-gooders, but they're completely reformed, which is weird seeing how the opening song is bragging about how wicked they are and all the bad things they're doing, and then immediately after, it's like that never happened. Yeah, we're so bad, we're so mean, we're outlaws. Oh, time to act like the good students that we are. What the hell is the point of that musical number? In fact, our lead character, Mal, is kind of getting tired of being so good. Her new upper crust status and now being in a relationship with Prince Ben gets her thinking, maybe the old wicked days were better than they thought. And speaking of which, see which that is, the daughter of Ursula, named Uma, is pissed off that her and her villain friends are still stuck on the evil island while all the other goody two-shoes get to live in harmony. So she has a plan to trick Mal into handing over the fairy godmother's magic wand to get him off forever. When the descendants try to stop this, they kidnap Ben and hold him hostage unless they turn the wand over. It's a thrilling fight slash dance slash rap off, resulting in a colorful climax where the descendants save the day. Well, there it is, nothing special, but wait a minute, there's still a half hour left. But that's a perfect place to stop, why are you still going? You defeated the villain, saved the guy, went back home, what else is there to do? Well, yeah, this is where the movie gets a little stranger than usual. A good chunk of the movie is just sitting around and talking. Not necessarily bad stuff, talking about emotions, where you belong, all sorts of teen angst, but... The movie's over, isn't it? An hour and a half, that's a decent runtime. you defeated the villain, why are we still going? This buildup eventually results in another climax, one not nearly as good as the first one and kinda disjointed. Even the message is kind of all over the place. It's about not judging a book by its cover, but then this one person seems evil, but then they're not, then they are evil again, and there's some really bad effects, and even then they don't really utilize that because they just kinda talk it out again, even though it's promising something big, and even that's kind of a half-ass resolution, but who cares, we have a dance scene at the end, that's all that seems to matter. What the hell did I just watch? This movie is all over the map, and I'd be lying if I said it was worth getting angry at because it's Descendants 2. I didn't even get that much into the first one. The elements that work in it are the same elements that worked in the first one. The dance sequences are really good, the sets and costumes are colorful, and again, you gotta give credit to a dumb idea actually taking time to analyze the characters, having them talk, having them actually discuss their problems. And they're good problems, like I said, figuring out your emotions, where you belong, all sorts of teen stuff. But it's not especially riveting because these kids still have to be marketable, they still have to be pretty, they still have to be just blank enough for you to insert yourself into their role. You're the good-looking dancer, you're the one going through troubles, you're the one that has the boy or girl that has the hots for you. And because of this, the actors are not really allowed to explore what they can do with the characters. So yeah, on the one hand, there's not as many bad things as the first one, there's no villain sitting around in a room acting like an old folks home or anything like that. But at the same time, why even have it connected to the Disney villains? It seems like there's no point. The Disney villains are some of the great cinematic characters, and to not really make that much of a connection to them just has me asking why'd you do it to begin with? So is it good? No. But again, like the other one, it's pretty harmless. I can see kids watching it and enjoying it, and there's nothing really bad in it for them. And there are surprisingly attempts at good ideas in there, like I said, trying to have character development, the good dancing, and so forth. But the majority of it is pretty dull. If you weren't a fan of the first one, this one's definitely not gonna sway you. It's not wave your fist anger inducing, but it doesn't leave an impact either, which some would say could be worse. If you like the first one, you'll probably like this one fine. If not, then just leave bad enough alone. 
And that's about it for this year's Disney December. My thoughts? Well, I guess like any Disney December, there were some good ones and there were some bad ones. The good ones weren't amazing or mind blowing, but they were very enjoyable. And the bad ones, yeah, they were bad. Nevertheless, it is neat to see a series of movies that a different generation grew up with. It's kind of interesting to see what people younger than me made popular, and if what they made popular still holds up. I'm happy to see that some of them do. It's nice to know that when a series of movies is trying to be manipulative, it can be manipulative in the right way. It can teach good lessons, it can open up the imagination, it can teach kids about character and story. It just also happens to be selling toys and clothes and soundtracks and so forth. I had a lot of fun this Disney December, and I hope you did too. Hopefully I'll see you next year, and until then, keep that Disney imagination soaring.